we could all take our seats. Uh, well, welcome to Brookings. Welcome to everybody here. Welcome to people in the overflow room, to people watching on the webcast, and to people following us on Twitter and other social media that I've been reminded about and I'm still trying to learn. Uh, I'm Bill Antholis. I'm the managing director at Brookings, which, as I like to say, means I do whatever Bruce Katz and the team at Metro tells me to do. And, uh, and today's topic is one that is uh, not only a big part of the Metropolitan Policy Program, it's a big part of all of Brookings. It's very dear to my heart and Strobe Talbot, the president, John Thornton, the chairman of Brookings and our board of trustees. And that's uh, jobs and the clean economy. Um, which connects to a, what we call an all-Brookings priority here of energy and climate policy. We have five research programs at Brookings. Uh, Metro is uh, the youngest, but um, or maybe the second youngest, um, uh, but is a real leader in this area. But all five of our research programs have people who have worked on energy and climate issues still working on them from China Energy and the Foreign Policy Program, Energy Security Initiative, also in foreign policy, scholars and economic studies who model climate change, who model energy policy, and people in governance studies such as myself who work on uh, various dimensions of everything from the, the, uh, uh, the new grid to uh, the domestic governance and international governance of energy issues. It's a real priority here at Brookings. But as I said, our Metropolitan Program has been a real leader on this in so many ways, um, as we will see in today's discussion of, of their report on sizing uh, the green economy and jobs. Let me just touch on a few other points. Personally, this is a huge topic for me. Uh, I've been working on it for 15 years since the Denver G7 summit, um, or summit of the eight as it became uh, known, uh, when Governor Ritter, I think, was the district attorney of Denver. So he was probably looking for all the, uh, the people that were trying to bash barricades and the rest as they shut down the city of Denver for these heads of state to arrive. And at that summit, the U.S. was touting a very strong, robust economy, and leaders from the rest of the world, uh, as President Clinton liked to say afterwards to those of us working on his staff, uh, he, he was made to be the skunk at his own garden party because we didn't have a uh, climate change policy and the Europeans were pushing us very hard to do so. That was about six months before Kyoto and the government went into a crash course to prepare for uh, the Kyoto climate change talks and that was my, my own baptism on this issue. And for the last 14 years, this subject, what kind of green jobs will this create, has been either a sub-theme or a front and center theme. Uh, a year ago, when the U.S. Senate was trying to match the House of Representatives in coming up with a comprehensive energy and climate policy. Uh, at that point, the recession was still uh, in its depths, and President Obama was out trying to talk about the creation of green jobs. But the question of how many green jobs would be created kept coming up, and frankly, there was no compelling answer. And there's real reasons why there's no compelling answer, which is these are very hard issues. There's a lot of uncertainty about the economics, about what counts as green, the environmental dimensions to this. Um, even some of the great game changers, like natural gas, have a huge set of questions around them uh, on the green side and on the economy side. Um, and so what, what we have today is really a terrific first draft, well, it's actually it's a, a real report, but it's a first attempt, I think, in very concrete terms, starting at the local level where people really worry about jobs and job creation, to size that up. Um, it's, it is terrific work. It's done with a lot of partners uh, who you will be seeing today. Uh, and it will break down into uh, three different parts. Uh, first, a discussion at the firm level of what job creation looks like, then at the regional and metro level, and then at a broader policy macro level where Bruce will be having a conversation with, uh, with Governor Ritter, who's now at Colorado State University. So with that, I really thank you all for coming. It's, uh, this is really a terrific report and a great set of discussions that we're looking forward to, and I'll turn it over to uh, Bruce Katz. So morning, everyone. Um, I want to thank Bill uh, for the introduction and the context setting and really for uh, his leadership in this institution and on this issue over, over many years. And before proceeding, I just want to start by thanking the people who actually did the work. I've got the easy job today. Uh, Mark Muro, Jonathan Rothwell, Devashri Saha, 
others on our staff, and then our colleagues at Battelle, uh, Mitch Horowitz, Marty Gruber, creativity, collegiality, painstaking attention to detail over a very, very long period of time. At the end of all these reports at Brookings, everyone asks, should we have really done that? You know, because it takes so much time and so much work. But so thank you to everyone who really did the hard research on this. And also um, Nathan Cummings Foundation, General Electric Foundation, Lazard, Living Cities, CERDNA for their particular support on our clean economy work, and then the Rockefeller Foundation who is supporting our policy and practice work around the clean economy in states and metropolitan areas. So a lot of thank yous at, at the beginning. Um, it, uh, I was going to try to find something along the lines of it takes a village. It takes think tanks, tech companies, a whole bunch of folks to get this stuff done. Today, um, as Bill is saying, we're celebrating not just the release of a report sizing the clean economy, but the unveiling of an interactive website to spur further research, policy, and practice all freely available at brookings.edu slash clean economy. Uh, we want today's forum to be a participatory event. We urge all of you in the audience and following on our webcast to engage online early and often. Please comment on Twitter via the hashtag we've created, Clean Econ. Uh, feel free to engage directly with me at Bruce underscore Katz, Mark at Mark Miro one and send us any questions that you have at MetroQ at brookings.edu. So here's the question before us. At a time of economic uncertainty, sluggish recovery, uh, federal polarization, can America's cities and metropolitan areas lead the country to a clean economy, to create jobs in the near term and retool and restructure our economy for the long haul? There is no doubt in our minds that moving to a clean economy is an environmental and energy imperative. But consumers, companies, and cities are also sending a clear signal. This is a market proposition and an economic transformation as profound as the information revolution. Consumers around the globe are starting to demand lower carbon, energy efficient products and services. One in four drivers in the United States, Europe, China, and Japan say that they plan to buy electric vehicles when they are readily available. That would put about 50 million electric cars on the road in places from Baltimore to Beijing to Reno to Tokyo. Companies see the clean economy as a growth sector. Three quarters of major global corporations plan to increase their clean tech budgets from 2012 to 2014, and global private investment in clean energy alone is up more than six-fold since 2004, reaching $154 billion in 2010. And cities and their metropolitan areas who have been early adapters of sustainable practice are now competing to build out their special niches in the clean economy. And I'll provide details later on Greater Seattle's bold strategies, just one among many to be the global hub of clean IT. Now for two years, the Brookings Metro program has hammered home the notion that the United States must pursue a different growth model post-recession. That is a next economy driven by exports, powered by low carbon, fueled by innovation, rich with opportunity, and delivered by the large metropolitan areas that drive our economy. Now today we're going to literally flip the dial and place the clean economy in the center of that macro vision and unveil the scale, the scope, the spatial geography of this promising growth engine. We have three sharp and timely findings. First, the clean economy is a significant, diverse, emerging market in the United States, already populated by seven, some 2.7 million jobs. It is disproportionately manufacturing and export intensive, and offers better prospects for low and middle skilled workers than the national economy as a whole. This is exactly the kind of economy we want to build post-recession. Second, metro areas are on the vanguard of the clean economy due to their concentration of innovative drivers and institutions, as well as the built environment in which most people live, work, and play. As in exports, 
metros specialize in different sectors of the clean economy, and the clustering of firms is catalyzing productive and sustainable growth. Third, the U.S. must unleash the entrepreneurial energies and dynamism of our metro engines to accelerate growth of the clean economy. That will require a strategic mix of private sector leadership and innovation and public policy that is stable, supportive, certain, and predictable. Given the nature and scale of global competition, U.S. governments at all levels must get in the game rather than get out of the way. Smart public action can leverage private investment, create desperately needed jobs, and cement our position as the leading edge of innovative growth. So the stakes are very high, and I don't think we should have any illusions about this. We have a lot to do here, and we are falling behind globally. Our competitors in mature and rising economies, Germany, Japan, China, fully understand the potential of clean, and they are working at warp speed to set favorable conditions for rapid growth and grab their share of the next market revolution. We need to get our public-private act together in cities and metros, in state capitals, and at the now polarized federal level. So let's start with our first finding. The clean economy is a significant, diverse, emerging market in the United States. In total, we find there are some 2.7 million clean economy jobs all across the United States. To put that number in perspective, the clean economy is nearly twice the size of the biosciences field and 60% of the 4.8 million strong IT sector. And as you can tell, the clean economy also has more jobs than fossil fuel related industries. Now our definition of the clean economy is as follows. Any economic activity measured in terms of establishments and jobs that produces goods and services with an environmental benefit or adds value to such project products using skills or technologies that are uniquely applied to those products. Now this definition yields a broad and varied picture of economic activity, old and new, public and private, green and blue. At the highest level, we find establishments and jobs grouping together in five discernible categories renewable energy, energy and resource efficiency, greenhouse gas reduction, environmental management and recycling, agricultural and natural resources conservation, and education and compliance. Now here we follow the categorization the Bureau of Labor Statistics is using for its own green jobs assessment due next year. Now these categories then break down into fine grain segments ultimately 39 in all. Renewable energy, for example, has nine segments, including solar and geothermal power and renewable energy services. Energy and resource efficiency has 13 separate segments, from electric vehicle technology to water-efficient products. Greenhouse gas reduction, environmental management, and recycling has 12 segments, including green chemical products, and professional environmental services, and so on. You, you get the idea. Each of the segments, in turn, then has a very distinct economic profile, cutting across multiple activities, skills, and occupations, and a distinct special geography, given the special assets and attributes of different places. So let's drill down a little so we just get on the same page. Under renewable energy, let's look at solar photovoltaics a young, rapidly innovating area. This segment we find employs, employs more than 24,000 people in 555 establishments. The list includes two major solar manufacturing firms, First Solar with a major plant in Toledo, BP Solar with a facility in this region in Frederick, and Bombard Electric in Las Vegas, which helps businesses in that region. The casinos, the hotels, the shopping centers shift their energy use. Under greenhouse gas reduction, let's take a look at professional environmental services, an example of the role that expert services can play in both domestic and global markets. This segment is much, much bigger, 140,000 workers 
in 5,400 establishments. CH2M in Denver is a consulting services providing uh, its wares throughout the United States and the world. Ecology Environment is a science and technical services firm with a large presence in LA. And then there's Black at Veach out of Kansas City, which is an engineering firm specializing in areas from environmental permitting to remediation. One more definitional cut to consider. We've identified a group of young, super innovative clean tech industries that cross multiple categories and show enormous growth potential. These industries are populated by companies with a median age of 15 years or less. And most notably, this portfolio of segments, including wind power, battery technologies, biofuels, and smart grid, grew about 8% a year since 2003, or twice as fast as the rest of the economy. So the clean economy is, not, is broad and it's diverse, uh, and providing that baseline definition we think is so critical to public discourse and private sector action going forward. It is also disproportionately productive. The clean economy is export intensive, already taking advantage of the demand for clean goods and services coming from abroad. In 2009, clean economy establishments exported about $54 billion, including about $49.5 billion in goods and an additional $4.5 billion in services. Significantly, clean economy establishments are, by our calculations, twice as export intensive as the national economy. Over $20,000 worth of exports is sold for every job in the clean economy each year, compared to just $10,400 worth of exports for the average U.S. job. Now, the export orientation of the clean economy today provides a platform for more exports tomorrow. With rising nations rapidly urbanizing, the demand for sustainable growth in all its dimensions will only grow, and the U.S. has the potential to serve that demand. The clean economy also supports a production-driven innovation economy. We find it employs a higher percentage of scientists than the national economy. 10% of clean e economy jobs are in science and engineering, compared to 5% in the US economy generally. Now, as we know, manufacturing and innovation are inextricably linked. This provides a stark challenge to the United States. We will innovate less unless we produce more. By our account, the clean economy is a vehicle for production. 26% of all clean economy jobs are involved in manufacturing, compared to just 9% of jobs in the economy as a whole. Manufacturing accounts for a majority of the jobs in over half of the clean economy segments, with many sectors having a supermajority of production-oriented jobs. Solar and wind energy, for example, have more than two-thirds of their jobs in manufacturing. And some segments, including appliances, water-efficient products, and electric vehicle technologies have over 90% of their jobs in manufacturing. The good news, clean manufacturing is growing, even in the face of national declines over the past decade in manufacturing employment. Finally, the clean economy is opportunity rich, providing prospects for a wide range of workers and good wages up and down the skills ladder. The clean economy is easy to enter available to people of all skill levels. 45% of all clean jobs are held by workers with a high school diploma or less, compared to only 37% of US jobs. Now, once a worker enters the field, he or she is more likely to receive career building training. 41% of clean jobs offer medium to long-term training, compared to just 23% of US jobs. The payoff is higher wages. The median wage in the clean economy is about $44,000 for the average occupation. That's significantly higher than the national equivalent of $38,000 in change. In summary, the clean economy is the kind of economy we want to build post-recession. Export-oriented, innovation-fueled, opportunity-rich, and balanced. So here's our second finding. Metros are on the vanguard 
of the clean revolution. Here's the heart of the American economy, 100 metropolitan areas that after decades of growth take up only 12% of our land mass, but harbor two thirds of our population and generate 75% of our gross domestic product. So this is a new economic geography, enveloping cities and suburbs, exurbs, and rural towns. And our research shows the extent to which these top 100 metropolitan areas in the aggregate are driving growth in the clean economy. In 2010, they constitute an increasing share of clean economy jobs, almost 64% in total. And they include an outsized share, 74% of jobs, in clean tech industries, including extraordinarily high shares in solar PV, battery technologies, smart grid, and wind energy. Innovative clean jobs are predominantly in the top 100 metros because these places concentrate the assets that drive innovation. From research institutions, to intermediaries, to commercialization, to ultimately deployment. Now the major metros are also leading the growth of clean economy jobs around the built environment. They harbor 78% of jobs in public mass transit, 90% of the jobs in green architecture, design and construction, since moving people more efficiently and making buildings energy efficient will primarily be a metropolitan act, given that's where most people live and travel and businesses locate. Incredibly, metros also include a decent share of clean jobs that are traditionally rural, with at least 23% of jobs in resource intensive activities like hydropower, sustainable forestry products and biofuels, and more than half of organic food and farming jobs. Now, metro economies, of course, do not exist in the aggregate. They have distinctive starting points and distinctive assets, attributes, and advantages. So our research digs deep to profile the clean economy potential of each of the top 100 metropolitan areas. Now, four metros, New York, LA, Chicago, and Washington are supersized job centers with more than 70,000 jobs apiece in the clean economy in 2010. The New York Metro alone has more than 152,000 clean economy jobs by our calculation. Other major metros, Philadelphia, San Francisco, Atlanta, Boston, Houston, Dallas, are also key players with more than 38,000 jobs apiece as of that year. Yet it's not just about the large metros. As we see here, a very different group of small and medium-sized metros have more than 3.3% of their jobs situated in the clean economy. And Albany leads the way with an impressive 6.3% of its jobs in the clean economy. The power of metros is the power of agglomeration, networks, and clusters. Our report finds that clusters the proximity of firms to businesses and related industries boost Metro's growth performance in the clean economy, and Metro's facilitate clustering. Examples include professional environmental services in Houston, solar photovoltaic in LA, fuel cells in Boston, wind in Chicago, water industries in Milwaukee, and energy efficiency in Philadelphia. So we can talk about clusters in the abstract, but it's best to see them in practice from the ground up. So let's travel to Philadelphia, the nation's fifth largest metropolis, which includes the city, obviously, and the surrounding counties. It's the fifth largest clean economy job center in the country. So here we find the advanced research engines of the University of Pennsylvania and Drexel in University City, who have partnered together on clean energy research and have provided a steady stream of talented workers to public and private nonprofit firms and intermediaries. Now, these universities are part of the Greater Philadelphia Innovation Cluster, based at the Navy Yard on the Delaware River. This consortium received $129 million in federal funding from multiple agencies to demonstrate the e efficacy of new building energy efficient components, systems, and models. The consortium includes strong support of City Hall, led by Mayor Michael Nutter, 
who has pioneered smart skills training in the energy efficient sector, as well as the Philadelphia Industrial Development Corporation, which has been a major investor in the Navy Yard. And then, of course, there are the firms and the companies, the fuel of the economy located throughout the Philadelphia metropolis. Downtown, we find Veridity Energy, a small smart grid firm with powerful technology tools. The density of Center City obviously supports a healthy mix of highly skilled service firms. So just around the corner is Real Win Win, which provides finance services to companies making capital investments in energy efficiency. But metro economies cross city and county borders because different kinds of firms require different urban and suburban footprints. So when we look out to the suburb of Radnor, just past Bryn Mawr and I-476, we find Iberdrola, the second largest wind operator in the United States, a subsidiary, a subsidiary of a major Spanish renewable energy company, and an example of the wave of foreign direct investment from Germany, from Spain, frankly, ultimately from China, that can help the US build out the clean economy. The Philly story reveals why cities and metro areas power our economy. Hyperlinked networks of private firms and public and nonprofit institutions that fertilize ideas, share workers, extend innovation, enhance competitiveness, and catalyze growth. So that leads to the final proposition. To build out this next economy, the US must unleash the entrepreneurial energies and dynamism of our metropolitan engines. We compete in a fiercely competitive world. While America continues to debate the legitimacy of global warming research, our competitors in established nations like Germany, Japan, and the UK, and rising nations like China are taking transformative steps to grow their clean economies in the precise places, Munich and Tokyo, London and Shanghai, that drive their national economies. The United States could compete with these and other nations. No other nation can match us in domestic demand, advanced research, venture capital, the power of metro concentration. But our potential will not be realized unless we provide a strong policy platform for the build out of the clean economy. Four steps are essential, are outlined in the report. Step one, scale up markets by catalyzing demand for clean economy goods and services. Markets respond to prices, standards, certainty, as well as the procurement and purchasing decisions of government. Step two, drive innovation by investing in advanced R&D at scale over a sustained period of time via new distributed networks. The US has a distinct competitive advantage in the innovation space if we fund it and if we exploit it. Step three, catalyze finance to produce and deploy more of what we invent. We cannot just be a nation of idea generators. We need to produce and manufacture and deploy again. And step four, align with cities and metropolitan areas to realize the synergies of clustering and place. Now our competitors know that economy shaping of this magnitude should start at the national scale. And so in a perfect world, we would have a federal government that would create a framework for growth and success. Now we have seen some of that leadership in the past few years through the procurement driving market scaling efforts of the Department of Defense, the creation of new very successful innovation vehicles like ARPA-E, some of the financial investments of the Department of Energy's loan guarantee program, and the metro supporting investments in new energy regional innovation clusters, like the Greater Philadelphia example, supported by agencies with diverse sets of missions and resources, like the Department of Energy, Commerce, Labor, SBA, Education, and others. But our global competitors are up in their goals, they're expanding their commitments, so we desperately need our federal government to go further and act with vision and ambition and consistency and send signals to markets and investors. To scale up markets, Congress should enact a national clean 
energy standard that signals a long-term consistent commitment to alternative energy sources at the national scale. To drive innovation, Congress should embrace the call by the American Energy Innovation Council, led by corporate titans like Bill Gates and Jeff Immelt, to invest $16 billion annually. That's about $11 billion over what we now invest in clean energy research and development through ARPA-E, but also networks of institutions that are multidisciplinary and engage seamlessly with the private sector. To catalyze finance, Congress should authorize a technology deployment finance entity, a green bank for short, to provide finance of the right scale and risk tolerance to ensure that ideas generated in America lead to products made in America. And Congress should also rationalize, reform, and selectively extend the myriad tax provisions and incentives that currently support the clean economy, but which are now chaotic, unstable, inconsistent, and frankly obtuse about evoking innovation and steady price declines for maturing clean technologies. And finally, to align with regions, Congress should more than double the number of energy innovation hubs and clusters that are seeded and funded. You know, frankly, it's not difficult to lay out what reforms and investments are needed to grow the clean economy. Our competitors have given us ample guidance on that score. The only issue is whether our federal government, riven by excessive partisanship and ideological polarization, can muster the will to get anything done. Now, fortunately, in the United States, we have a default proposition when our national government falters and goes on a frolic and a detour. Our states act as laboratories of democracy. And as California's Lieutenant Governor Gavin Newsom recently observed, our cities and metropolitan areas act as laboratories of innovation. And so that's how, for the time being, we'll need to build our clean economy in the United States the hard way from the ground up. The good news, there is no shortage of policy innovation and political commitment at the state and metro scale, as we're going to hear, frankly, from Governor Ritter later this morning. To scale up markets, California has set an aggressive renewable portfolio standard, 33% renewable energy by 2020. With that strong foundation, San Jose and other cities and counties in California are doing their part to facilitate and accelerate consumer adoption, streamlining or even eliminating building permits for solar panels. To drive innovation, Wisconsin has created the School of Freshwater Sciences at the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee to leverage that metro's rising position in the clean economy, and particularly the blue economy. The Milwaukee Water Council is building on this, spearheading a network of scientists and companies to realize Milwaukee's ambition to be the global hub for freshwater research, firm creation, and business expansion. To catalyze finance, Connecticut recently created the Connecticut Clean Energy Finance and Investment Authority, capitalized with some $50 million annually. This Green Bank could accelerate the generation, the transmission, the adoption of alternative energy. At the municipal scale, New York City has, has capitalized an energy efficiency corporation to spur the financing, working closely with the private sector on new products, the financing of energy efficiency in the building sector. And finally, smart metros are now moving to build out their special industry clusters. In Greater Seattle, for example, the Puget Sound Regional Council, government and business, has developed a business plan to cement that metro's natural position as the global hub of energy efficient building technologies. Their smart public-private initiative is to establish a facility to test, integrate, and verify promising energy efficient products and services before launching them to market. And significantly, that metro vision is being supported by the state of Washington, which is committed to match any federal investment in the testing network, and ultimately that testing facility will be self-sustaining from the private sector. So let me conclude with this vision. Let's imagine a world in 20 years where the clean economy permeates every aspect of our economic and social fabric, 
and in the process enhances productivity and competitiveness, lowers energy use, energy dependence, spurs further innovation, and provides quality work, quality jobs for a broad cross-section of our citizenry. We believe today's research and the power of millions of consumers and entrepreneurs, tens of thousands of companies, and hundreds of cities and metros gives us the hope that this vision can become reality. We have the data to set a platform for sustainable growth. We have the roadmap to set the foundation for smart investment. We have the entrepreneurs in all sectors, public, private, civic, to innovate and then replicate those innovations. Let's build the clean economy, worker by worker, firm by firm, metropolitan area by metropolitan area. Thank you very much. A um, couple questions, and then we'll move on to question back here. Yeah, we are uh, a small manufacturing company. My partner, Roger Cope, and I, we've invested about $25 million in the last three years in technology upgrades, in innovation, in, in ways to manufacture uh, products, and a lot of it is in the wind, in, in, in the wind innovation industry. One of the problems is how does a small voice get heard? We now have an opportunity to start at the foundation of manufacturing from a, a casting or a foundry type situation that is a clean foundry uh, that is different than anything in the world, and we need to find some money. And it's very difficult after we've, we're a small company ourselves, about $40 million. We employ about 200 people, and we've kind of exhausted what we can do on our own, and now we need a place that says, we need to be able to go to the marketplace and get funding to build this. It's available now. It's going to happen now. These are things that will employ people right now. A entrepreneur, as you say, going into the marketplace, is he bankable? Are these right. ideas bankable? Uh, most of your entrepreneurial ideas are, are muddy and gooey, and they're not bankable. So how do we find a place that takes this muddy and gooey and sticky kind of stuff and says it's real? This is something that creates exactly where you want to go, not 20 years from now, today. I right. will, I'll invest this afternoon, if I can find the person that will do it with me, in this process, in the ways to do things, but there's no avenue for a small voice like mine to get anywhere. How do you suggest we do that? Where, where are you located? Just by, by where? Michigan. Michigan. So I, I think over time, frankly, um, the kind of investments you're seeking will be more routine in the United States. But we're coming out of an economic model where it was very easy to finance real estate, very easy to finance housing growth, and fairly complicated to finance in the manufacturing and industrial sector. We had a certain growth model in this country, and we're now transitioning slowly to a growth model that's more productive and sustainable um, and ultimately inclusive. Um, at the end of the day, for this transition period, because it's nice to talk about 20 years, but um, you've got a proposition today. <laughs> um, you know, I think what we're going to be seeing really is at the local and metropolitan and, and state scale, the kind of public-private investments that sort of bridge this period, where ultimately we can move to more sustainable finance, primarily driven at the private sector. Um, you know, Michigan, uh, from my perspective, is the Germany of the United States. It is production oriented, it is export oriented. You could actually see Canada from Detroit, you know. <laughs> um, what, what, what we need to find within the resources of that state, and I'm not just talking on the tax side or the revenue side, but in the incredible wealth that has been built up in that state from the manufacturing sector, are the right vehicles that can support these kind of propositions. But that to me is a bridge. I mean, ultimately, if government sets a platform, sends signals to the market about certainty and predictability and stability that we are moving down this path, the private sector, I think, will finance most of this. And that, may, that time won't be too far away. Um, other question, comments? Rachel? Well, you, you can't ask a question. No, it's not for me. We have <laughs> oh. a question from Twitter. OK. <laughs> um, and it's from the Millville Partners Group. And they're wondering, how can we overcome the hyper-partisan politics of this? And as I was saying, we're about to move to our second panel. Um, I, you know, I think the further on down you go in our system, 
the less partisan it is. And, and I, think I think there is a natural, what we would call a pragmatic caucus in the United States. And that particularly exists at the local and metropolitan scale, but in many places exists at the state scale. Because the members of that caucus, and I'm not just talking about elected officials, but corporate leaders, university leaders, civic leaders, and elected officials, prize place over party and prize collaboration over conflict. They wake up every day saying, how do I make Denver better? How do I make Colorado better? And they don't exist in this kind of ideological food fight that tends to permeate the federal discourse. So I think the way we build out the clean economy, and frankly, we restore sanity to our political system, is from the ground up and from this pragmatic network of people who understand that the challenge today is to create jobs in the near term, retool the economy for the long haul, and deal with these pressing global energy and environmental imperatives. So I'm, you know, we're sitting in a town that today, day by day, is talking about the debt limit and talking about some very, very complicated budget and tax uh, issues, and hopefully they'll be able to resolve that. But over time, I think the real resolution to partisanship and polarization is by taking a lesson from the practitioners and the pragmatists at the local level. And with that, I am going to introduce Brian Walsh. Um, I think people, anyone who reads Time Magazine or follows the blogosphere um, is familiar with Brian. Um, he is one of the principal writers, thinkers, observers in the environmental and clean economy scene. Um, and he is an avid tweeter. Um, so, Brian will come up and introduce the next panel. Thank you very much. Okay, can you hear me now? Thanks. Um, thank you, Bruce, for that uh, very kind introduction. Um, and I want to thank Brookings and Patel for putting this report together because I've been reporting on environmental issues for four years now. And I've written I don't know how many stories about green jobs and clean tech jobs and clean economy jobs. And it's nice to finally have a definition and a, a, a number I can finally show my editors because I think they're always slightly suspicious that uh, this could be almost anything or nothing, really. Uh, but it does show the sheer size of the clean economy. It's much bigger, I think, than, than we, we often realize. And it's also all around us. Uh, that was very clear from that presentation. It's not just uh, the kind of sexy jobs, the, the, the high-tech shoulder jobs that we tend to write about, uh, but it's mass transit, it's waste management, uh, it's conservation, things like that. And, and that really shows, I think, both uh, that, that these jobs are more normal than we, we think, but also there's a real potential for growth there as well. Um, at the same time, what was sort of touched on in the very end, that last question, I think, about the partisan gridlock that we face now is that um, we are at a very important juncture here uh, now. We, we face a situation where we have a desperate need for high quality jobs in this country. Uh, we're suffering with 9.2% unemployment. Um, and that's on top of the, the, the very pressing energy and climate problems that uh, these, these jobs are, are meant in some ways to, to deal with. And uh, we have to worry about energy, energy security. We have to worry about 
where we'll stack up in the future because as, as was clear from before, the United States is very much at risk of falling behind on, on this area. We see countries like Germany, we see countries like China certainly uh, taking this much more seriously, uh, investing uh, from the top down in a way that uh, we've had a very hard time, I think, in the United States. I mean, over the last two years, or last few years, we've certainly uh, seen a lot of investment uh, through the Recovery Act, uh, through what, what we're talking about, what DOE is doing, but at the same time, we face, I think, a concern that there's going to be a cliff, uh, a, a real, uh, if not just a, uh, you know, a down cycle, but potentially a really, a really frightening uh, you know, cliff that we might be falling off of. Uh, so with this, this panel, we're going to really sort of try to get a sense as to where the U.S. is now on the clean economy sector. Uh, we'll be talking to some people who actually produce jobs, actually produce uh, products in, in that sector as well. And we're going to see where in that environment are we really poised to see growth. Um, we talked a little bit before about the policy challenges here. We'll, we'll go a little bit more into depth there, both talking about what can be done, I think, federally, but also what can be done on the local and metro area where I think we see those green shoots of, of growth really uh, potential, uh, potentially much more perhaps productive than what we might see in the federal level. Um, and then we'll, we'll talk really about the need for, for innovation. Well, we're at a period where I think we need to try something new. Um, we, we can't necessarily continue the old policies of the past especially as the sector grows, as clean energy continues to grow, we're going to see, I think, a limit to how far subsidies can go. Um, we're already beginning to see that actually around the, around the world. You might have seen there was a great uh, piece in Foreign Affairs by David Victor at Stanford about these this concerns about this, this, this not a coming clean tech crash, but certainly a sense that you're going to get squeezed out in the future. So what, what can go forward? What do we uh, invest our, you know, quite honestly, limited funds in to get the most bang for our buck? So, let me start with uh, the introductions for our panelists. To my left here is Dr. Arun Majumdar. He is the first director of the Advanced Research Projects Agency for, the, for Energy, the ARPA-E, which is the country's only agency devoted to transformational energy research and development. He uh, also serves as a senior advis advisor to uh, Secretary Chu, and he was the associate laboratory director for energy and environment at Lawrence Berkeley uh, before he joined that. Uh, to his left, we have Brian Sager, who is the founder and Vice President of Corporate Development for NanoSolar, uh, really one of the most promising uh, solar PV companies out there right now. He manages the company's government programs, strategic partnerships, uh, and the intellectual uh, product property portfolio. To his left, left is Timothy Richards, who is the Managing Director for Energy Policy at the DC office for, for GE. He represents uh, GE on energy policy and really leads a team of GE government policy leaders in DC and around the world. And lastly, we have James Rossman, who is a managing director at Lazard's Power, Energy, and, and Infrastructure Group, uh, where he heads the firm's global efforts on alternative energy. So Arun, I want to talk with uh, you first. Um, everyone's very excited about RPE. I love, you know, it's, it's the thing that gets people excited here when I go elsewhere around the world. They really see that as something that's, that's, that's a truly innovative way to, to get at some of these problems. So tell me a little bit about what RPE does, what your, what your daily job is like, and, and what kind of purpose it's serving, why we, why we really need it. I'm excited too, mm -hmm. by the way. That's good. <laughs> <laughs> uh, first of all, let me just take this opportunity to give my best wishes to Andy Refkin, I think who is uh, ill, fell ill, who was going to be here. Um, and so my best wishes to him. Thanks to you, Mark, and your team for doing all the heavy lifting for this meeting and the reports, et cetera. Um, believe it or not, this is my second public event for the day, so I'm trying to transform my brain and get into this mode now. <clears throat> but RPE was created two years ago um, in the model of DARPA, and it's important to understand the history of DARPA. It was, that was created in 1958 in response to Sputnik when it was felt that the United States was losing its technological lead, and there was a vulnerability uh, for the nation, and it went on to create things like the internet and GPS and other uh, wonderful things that you all use today. So no pressure on us. <laughs> You're supposed to do that for the energy field. And you know, I, I believe that we are, and I think a lot of us share this belief, that we are in that vulnerable state. Uh, we are importing uh, more than 50% of the oil that we use. We're paying a billion dollars a day. And that's a source of our vulnerability. It's a national security issue. It's an economic growth issue. If you could spend the dollars out here, it would be many more jobs. Um, if you look at the grid, for example, or infrastructure, the average age of the assets on the grid are 42 years, two years more than the lifetime. 
and that is an issue. So you look across the whole uh, infrastructure that we have and the technologies, um, it, is a, it is a vulnerability. And you know, Secretary Chu has said this very nicely, you know, when the oil, oil prices go up, we hit the panic button. When the oil prices come down, we hit the snooze button. And that's no way to run the United States of America. And so I think this is the, the time to really invest in the future. And while this is a national security issue, by the way, for the United States, it's a national security issue for China, because they're importing oil as well. It's a national security issue for India and other growing economies. So this is a global market for things. And we need to look at it as a way to innovate, to be able to address not only the United States needs, but frankly, the global market, just with, the, with what we did with information technology, with biotechnology and others. We need to do it for clean energy technologies. And it's a massive market because people are looking for technologies to adopt and to create their own security. So just a few examples. Um, we all know that we are hopefully transitioning a transportation sector, which is a vulnerability, to some element of electrification. So, uh, and that is going on, plug-in hybrid. It's just too expensive. So our way of looking at it, Norpi, is that let's go for that battery, which does not exist today, by the way, but that battery that will make the electric cars have a longer range and be cheaper than internal combustion engine cars so you can sell without subsidies. Okay? So that battery is, may, need not be a lithium-ion battery. So we are looking at now we've created a program called BEAST, Batteries for Electrical Energy Storage for Transportation. <coughs> Just like you have an Intel inside in your, most of your computers, we hope you have a beast inside in your cars <laughs> in the future. And this market, again, as I said, it's not just the US market, but worldwide. But to make it to that price point, cost is everything. Uh, and you know, so this you know, whole class of metal air batteries, including lithium air, lithium sulfur batteries, these are really hard, challenging problems. And it's the idea of translating science, what we know about chemical reactions and electrochemical reactions, translate into a device, so the first prototype which is pre-venture. And that's the area that, that we are trying to, um, trying to focus on. Um, solar energy, everyone has access, in the world has access to solar. It's just too expensive to convert that to electricity. Uh, and so it's about utility scale about three to four times more than what we get from natural gas combined cycle, which is the cheapest, five cents a kilowatt hour. Okay, it's just three times more expensive. So just like President Kennedy created a moonshot to go to the moon, and return safely within the decade, we have now created a sunshot to reduce the cost of electricity from solar to five cents a kilowatt hour within this decade. And that needs innovation. You cannot do business as usual. And it is not just the module. It is balance of system, it's power electronics, <clears throat> and other things. So I can go on and on. But you know, that's the kind of thing that RPE is focusing on, to, to develop a foundation that will create new industries that perhaps does not, do not exist today. Because that's what DARPA did with the internet and everything else. That's the opportunity we have. And as I said, this is our national security, our economic growth and prosperity at stake, and environmental security. Those are the three securities that we have. I guess a quick follow-up. Do you, you know, in a venture capital situation, it's a given that most ideas will not pan out. That's, that's part of the deal. Do you feel free to fail in the same way, looking for that, that one innovation that will really make the difference? So this is what we do. I mean, the BEAST program that I've talked about, we set technology agnostic targets, OK? So this is double the energy density of today's state-of-the-art lithium-ion battery and one-third the cost. We don't care if it's a banana <laughs> and that can do it, OK? So these are, you know, as I said, the whole class of lithium-ion batteries. And there's a competition right now. We don't know which one's going to succeed. But if one of them does, this is a new industry that is created that does not exist. I'll talk about another program called Electrofuels that we created. All the fuels that are developed in alternate way, the biofuels that we talk about, are using photosynthesis. Whether it's sugarcane, whether it's cellulose, whether it's corn, whether it's algae, I don't care what you, today all biofuels are photosynthetic biofuels. But that efficiency of converting sunlight to fuels is less than 1%. Okay, so which means you'll need a lot of land and water. There's sustainability issues, and we need to go down that, that pathway in order to reduce the cost and make it cost competitive with petroleum-based fuel. What we did in RP is to create a completely different route of creating biofuels without using photosynthesis. You could do that. 
You could take electricity from nuclear, electricity from wind or solar, use bugs, which are non-photosynthetic bugs, and there's a lot of biology that's non-photosynthetic. You and I are non-photosynthetic. We are not green. <laughs> so use the bugs to fix carbon dioxide, use the energy from electricity, fix carbon dioxide, make oil. And people thought this is really risky. Really, this is almost impossible. Well, in a year and a half, people are making oil in the labs now at MIT, at NC State, and other places. And that's the kind of opportunity which, of course, electrofuel industry does not exist today. But if we had not invested and taken the risk, and some, you know, many of them will fail, you know, no one else would. This is pre-venture. Mm -hmm. Venture capital wants to see that first prototype before you invest. Mm -hmm. I'm from the Silicon Valley, so I know exactly what, the, what they're trying to do. This is before that, to create the industry, just like TCP that was created in, in DARPA in 1968. That's when it started. Okay? This, there was no industry of internet at that time, mm -hmm. but that's when it you know, started, and you create the foundation that you create multiple industries out of that. So I think that's where we are. Uh, Brian, I know we talked a little bit before about how nanosolar is doing right now. It's, it's really, as I said, one of the most innovative PV companies out there. I think you know, you, your, your stuff is sold out for quite a while. You have a better chance of getting a ticket to a Justin Bieber concert than you'd have if you don't already have a reservation <laughs> for one of your products. So give me a sense of where you are now in the market globally, especially, and some of the challenges you still face as you, you know, continue to grow. Sure. Nanosolar uh, is almost 10 years old. and. Uh, like many overnight successes, it's taken that long to get to where we are. Uh, from the perspective of what really the, uh, you know, the early R&D stage was for us, proving out the technology, proving out pilot line processes, proving out the prototype attributes, we were able to access a lot of funding from the federal government, everything from Department of Defense to DARPA funding to National Science Foundation to Department of Energy. So a wide variety of R&D funding mechanisms federally. We had state level support and we were also able to raise about $400 million in, in private equity through four funding rounds. Uh, we strongly believe, and I personally believe, that if a technology is promising, if there's a value proposition and it's potentially scalable, that high quality technology innovation can find funding through ARPA, through DARPA, through other mechanisms. Uh, and many of our sister companies in Silicon Valley have also received funding of various sorts precisely along that pathway. The challenges uh, for growth of a company uh, are the scaling framework. And in particular, it costs hundreds of millions of dollars to build up a factory. Uh, so things like the Department of Energy's Loan Guarantee Program or other mechanisms like that are very helpful. And once you've built that factory and you've got product, you run into a conundrum, which in my view is almost a textbook definition of irony, in that the innovation that excited the early investors, be they the Department of Energy, Defense, or private equity investors, uh, the potential for disruptive growth from that innovation uh, is perceived in a risk-averse commercial banking culture as a source of huge risk. So the very innovation which drives the early investment impedes the later investment. And in that later investment mechanism, how do you get past those issues? Well, the more innovative the technology is, whether it's uh, bacteria-driven uh, biofuel production or printed solar uh, photovoltaic cells, uh, it's untested in terms of durability, in terms of the value proposition over the whole value chain in which that product is being played out. Any new product, by definition, has no operating history because it's a new product. So when uh, some, a debt financing entity comes along to do some project with this new technology or this new innovation, one of the things they'll do is go to a third party engineer and say, what's the risk associated with this so I can figure out what my debt structure should look like? And the company that's got that innovation says, well, it's a new product. There is no 25, 30 year operating history. And the third party engineer says, well, I can't assign a risk. And then the debt financier says, well, I can't assign debt. And so our customers then have a challenge. You know, what do they do in, these, in this situation? They can either wait, uh, which is what many do, wait until the operating history is sufficiently developed that you've got a statistical de-risk for underwriting of any debt financing for downstream projects, or you can go for pure equity projects, which are statistically relatively rare. And in either case, that slows down uh, the manufacturing ramp up because you are waiting or 
dealing with a, a risk aversion, the collision of two cultures, the R&D risk embracement culture and the commercial banking and risk aversion culture collide at the exact scale when a company has a new product with no operating history, when that company is trying to become bankable, and that's what I'm talking about when I'm talking about <coughs> debt financing. The other side of the risk, besides the technology, is the balance sheet risk. So you might say, well, I've got a warranty for my product, but the customer might say, well, you are a 10-year-old company and your product warranty is more than twice the duration of your company's history to date. How do I know you'll be around in 20 years? Your balance sheet is such and such, but you know, what is it going to be in five years or 10 years or 20 years? So just the scale of growing companies out of the R&D stage to where you have mitigation of both the technological risk from the risk-averse commercial banking culture for bankability, as well as the um, reduction in risk for balance sheet risk for a company which just isn't at the scale of GE, both of those are really important uh, issues that every company at our scale tackles. Uh, Tim, GE clearly is already a major uh, player in clean tech, and it'll cost the entire really breadth of the clean economy from water to gas to, uh, to wind, now increasingly to solar as well. Uh, give us a little intro into, into all those facets, I guess, of, of GE's role in the clean economy, both nationally but also as a function in, in metro areas. I know, for instance, sure. out of that report, you play a, a major role in the fact that Albany, not the, the city that will jump to your mind, actually has more per capita clean economy jobs than anywhere else in the country. Well, <clears throat> thank you very much, Brian. Um, as you say, GE is a, is a long-standing established company. And I think it's important to, to think about some of the aspects that um, GE brings to this discussion because GE, of course, is Thomas Edison's company. So uh, for us, when we talk about innovation, it's truly in the blood. Uh, this, is, this is a company that was built around innovation always having the, the first products, the best products. Um, we were one of the original companies in the Dow Jones, and we're the only one that is still in the Dow that was in the original Dow. And how do you get there? I really, I think it ties directly back to innovation, because uh, if you don't completely commit yourself to innovation and being dynamic and taking risks to make sure that you're transforming the company, you're not staying tied to what you've done historically just because that's the way you've always done it, you won't, be, it's proven, you can't stay uh, at the top and you can't stay in the Dow Jones Industrial Average. So I think that's an important uh, starting point. Now, um, I was quite pleased, I hadn't realized that Albany was um, one, the top cluster when it comes to, to clusters and I do think that that's a really great story because of course GE's power and water business is headquartered in Schenectady, New York, that means our wind business in particular is there, the headquarters of the wind business, and we've been adding jobs uh, in that wind business. It's the largest US-owned company in the wind industry, um, the leading supplier of wind turbines in the, in the US market. Um, we also, though, it's very important, we also have in Niskayuna, New York, also in that Albany cluster, it's where our global research center is located. And so we have uh, hundreds of PhDs doing research much in the clean energy area in Niskayuna, New York. And I think that clearly contributes to the fact that the Albany area is a, uh, is a leader nationwide. Um, let me just talk about a couple of other metropolitan areas in a way that also highlights the range of, of work that GE does in the clean energy sector. Um, we view, just as President Obama does, we, we view clean energy as everything from solar and wind and other renewables through gas, uh, high efficiency gas turbines, and nuclear energy. And um, we are the largest exporter of clean energy um, by that definition, particularly because we export so many gas turbines. Our gas turbines are made in uh, Greenville, South Carolina. We have about 3,100 employees there. We've been increasing employment in Greenville over time. Uh, and we've been investing in these gas turbines to make them constantly more efficient and lower emissions. And our most recent investment is actually entirely based around making those gas turbines work with a renewable energy heavy economy. So in particular, what that means is being able to cycle the gas turbines so that they're able to balance load when you have wind blowing, you, know, you can cycle down. When the wind is not blowing or the sun is not shining, you can cycle them up. And it really is a, uh, a very effective way to 
keep on increasing the percentage of renewables that you can have on the grid. So that's Greenville, uh, Schenectady and Greenville. Um, I'll just mention Wilmington, North Carolina. That's where we have our uh, nuclear business headquartered. We have about 1,600 people in Wilmington. And um, that's a very heavily engineering oriented uh, workforce. And we've also been investing in the local community college to help develop the future technicians who can, uh, who can actually fill the jobs that we need to fill because there are a lot of specialized, but you know, not, not master's degree or PhD uh, level engineering types of jobs that you need to fill. Um, one more business to mention is our water business based just outside of Philadelphia, another one of the uh, clean energy hubs. Our water business is, um, is a membrane and chemicals business, but the membrane is, uh, is used for water filtration and can be used for both municipal and for, um, and for industrial applications. So what it comes down to is we've got a really vibrant set of businesses if, if you add those all up, it's about $21 billion of total revenue from our clean energy businesses. And it's been growing, and we've been investing here in the United States and around the world. Um, I would say that, that not all is rosy, and we have to recognize that the clean energy business does depend, just as actually the entire energy business depends fundamentally on government policy. Um, it always has. It's a heavily, regula heavily regulated business. And, um, and the fact is that the current impasse here in Washington is raising issues. And um, one very clear example <coughs> of that would be for our wind business, where the production tax credit for wind is scheduled to expire at the end of next year. And you already see that there, are, there has been a decline in the uh, rate of installation of new wind projects here in the United States, especially here in the first quarter of uh, 2011. It's dropped. So, We've got to watch that closely. It's a, it's a real challenge, and um, I think the solar industry could have a similar challenge as uh, tax credits expire there, uh, electric, char electric vehicle charging stations. It goes on and on. Um, so careful work has to be done. Um, I know Bruce spoke about the value of a clean energy standard. Perhaps in the next round we can come back to that. But there's a lot of policy aspects that need to be addressed. Just as a quick follow-up, I mean, you know, we, we, we have this, this feeling, I think, the U.S. is behind when it comes to getting that investment to deploying that clean tech. Is that, is that, is that the way it looks from where you're standing as well? Um, well, where I'm, where I'm sitting, I think we are, the U.S. is in very good shape right now in terms of our innovative capability. So I think a lot of the ideas are there. When, when we've done uh, outreach to take in good ideas in the clean energy space, we get a lot of great ideas from U.S. innovators. Um, the biggest challenge is whether you're going to have the long-term long certainty about the market being there uh, to convert that into investment here in the United States. And that's really important because we have the opportunity to be an export powerhouse in clean energy. But if we don't have a domestic market, you won't be an export powerhouse either. So it actually all really ties together. You will have the growth in China. You will have the growth in Europe in these clean energy areas. But will the U.S. be positioned to take a major part of that. Mm -hmm. Jim, what's, uh, what's Lazard doing in this field really to, to help play a role in, in creating and, and scaling up these, these kind of tech firms that we're talking about? Um, th thanks, Brian. And uh, yeah, help is an unusual word to use around banking. <laughs> but I, uh, uh, we actually sit in a very. Uh, um, it's out of the goodness of your heart, I know. Yes, right. <laughs> <laughs> I guess we're the ones who are we're, um, sort of commercially in incentivized to actually go out and find the bankable ideas. And, uh, and so as a result, we sit in a very interesting nexus point where our job is to go out and, and scour the country um, looking for the innovative companies, which we think we can match up with the, the capital that's uh, available, both in the primarily in the private sector, but when we, we can develop good um, public financing ideas, we, we work on those as, as well. Um, and I think I, I, many of the things that we're seeing, um, and this is uh, you know, our, my full-time job is, is really focused on the U.S., on growth companies. Um, we see a lot of the challenges that the panel is, is echoing, and you know, we could rapidly you know, fire them off. It's the, you know, is there really going to be adoption of these technologies? Um, Brian, you sounded like my underwriting committee that we often have to face when explaining why we, we're, we're covering the companies. Um, the capital required to scale, and it's not just that initial capital to go from being a pilot program to having your first commercial facility. It's really going from that first commercial facility up to your, 
you know, your 10 projects as your, as your sales build. Um, and the market is changing every year, and it's rapidly becoming a, a global market. We've cited China. You can talk about India, Eastern Europe, uh, South Africa, North Africa. It's a rapidly globalizing industry, and in many ways, it's very disruptive to the young companies who are trying to play into what they thought was Europe for, for a while and the, and the subsidized regime there. And they're finding they can no longer just go to a Munich beer hall and sell a lot of solar panels. <laughs> they now have to get malaria shots and, and go to places they'd never heard of because you know, these people are putting solar panels in their neighborhoods. And, uh, and so it's a very different market. So globalization is having a big uh, impact. And there's one theme we didn't speak about on the challenge side, which is that um, you know, this <coughs> isn't social networking. For, you know, this isn't right. Twitter. This is, you, you uh, young companies are up against large incumbents. So a biofuel company is competing against Exxon. <laughs> a solar company is competing against G, I mean, there, it, we all, there's a, the incumbency issue is a big theme for us. And it often leads, I think, to alternative energy companies thinking about strategic partners a lot earlier than other innovative technologies. On the positive side, um, what we find very encouraging is the innovation theme in the U.S. I think there's a great deal of innovation taking place in the U.S. right now. But also we're moving into a greater installed base. So you're now seeing a wind market in the United States that has close to 45 gigawatts installed. You have a solar base that's rapidly growing. And you have a global installed base. And so what that means is that we're learning things about these products, and we're also developing ancillary industries, service industries around those businesses. Mm -hmm. We're finding that in wind that actually um, domestic companies do quite well because the components are large and need to be manufactured um, locally. In fuels, we're way beyond ethanol. We're into the sunlight-less you know, biofuels now. So we're moving into the second and third generation of, of products. And as a result, as these businesses scale and new technologies are developed, cost is coming down. So I think we're sort of short term, given what's going on in, in Europe, given what's going on in the lack of clarity coming out of Washington, as an alternative energy banker, we're sort of short term neurotic. <laughs> but we're, we're long term bullish about the industry. And I think, though, that the unique challenge is, because this isn't social networking and you need large amounts of capital, is that it's critical that there are policies in support of these industries to help bring them from those very early stages through. Because as Arun said, it's, you know, it's one in 100 at the angel stage or his stage, and then it's a one in 10 shot at the VC stage. You know, it's got to be a one to one shot five to 10 years later for this industry to survive. And um, you know, we could talk about, the, and so the final point I would make is that the diversification of the industry. It's no longer uh, it's solar and wind. And, and biofuels. It's, um, we're find, finding very innovative things taking place in the United States around recycling, taking dirty plastic and turning it into you know, crude at $40 a barrel, taking you know, wet garbage, doing industrial scale composting in places like Boston and Vancouver, which are really quite exciting developments. And a lot of these guys are technology agnostic and they're process smart. And I think we're going to have a future of alternative energy companies who are quite good around engineering and process. And that's going to help, uh, I think, sort of take the United States to the, the next level. And it's an area where we play quite well. Aaron, I'm going to go back to you. Um, the, uh, Bill Gates and his other heavyweights, the American Energy Innovation Council, I mean, they're, they're suggesting that we spend billions more on R&D when it comes to uh, that side of things. As you point out, you know, we are pretty good at the idea side. But how could we get better? I mean, if you, you know, what are your, you know, your real wish list for, for improving that innovation system when it comes to energy for America? I think I agree with everything that has been said. I mean, it, from where we are in ARPA-E, um, that has to go to the next stage of the first in a class plant. And that is, as you were pointing out, it is very difficult to get financing uh, because this is not you know, going to be paying off in two years or three years like software does. This is going to be longer term, and access to low-cost capital is absolutely key, and because if you do not have that, you're not going to have the first-of-a-kind plant out here, and that's going to be cherry-picked by other nations as is going on. And once you have sunken costs somewhere else, um, and if that region has demand, as was pointed out, 
uh, the, the next stage of in a commercial or pre-commercial plant will be there as well. And we have just lost the access to that technology. And once you have the first of a class uh, in a manufacturing plant going somewhere else, you will likely see R&D going mm -hmm. there as well. And that's sort of a bread and butter. So there's a chain effect that could happen. And it's really important to use, as was said, to use the local demand out here to create some demand for clean energy so that some of it stays out here. Actually, a lot of it stays out here, but also providing the, the, so the access to low-cost capital to be able to keep the in-between manufacturing out here. So that you really need to look at it as a system. And while RPEs are the really you know, upstream, you've got to look at the whole stream and, keep, and make sure that we create the local demand as well as the financing out here. Mm -hmm. Uh, just a quick follow-up, are we, I mean, unless there's some kind of pull policy, some kind of guarantee of demand, is, are we going to keep hitting this problem again? You know, we talked about some of the policy choices out of the, uh, the report about a, a clean energy standard. I mean, is that a, a must, really, if, if this is going to break through? Well, I think you have, you know, things like renewable portfolio standards. I think 29 states, someone can correct me if I'm wrong, um, and varying kinds. That's right. Um, and so that's, that's, that's a demand pull. But as I said uh, before, I think I said this, that many of the assets on the grid, for example, are two years beyond the lifetime. Mm -hmm. And at some point, there's a, there's a vulnerability out there that utilities and ISOs and all will have to address that. And the question is, could we use that demand pull that is likely to come to create those technologies that are not only will be deployed out here, but deployed elsewhere in the world? Because the grid is growing more as faster than other parts of the world and out here. But we could use our demand to do that. Mm -hmm. And that's the opportunity I think we should make available. Some of it is creating RPS and hopefully some clean energy standards. But uh, some of it is just hitting asset walls. Mm -hmm. And it's the reliability of the grid, et cetera, that we could rely on. Brian, you really, I think, diagnosed the, the financial troubles that, that face a company like yours when you're trying to, to scale up. So what kind of help do you need? I mean, you, again, sort of, if you had the power to make that happen, what would you, what would you, what kind of system would you craft? I would balance demand and supply side incentives. The demand side, RPS, clean energy standards are all critical, but in the absence of supply side incentives, you can view the demand side of the United States as an enormous economic stimulus package for Beijing. Uh, so if we don't want the U.S. taxpayers to demand products that can't be produced in the U.S. because there's no manufacturing base, we better start supporting the manufacturing base in the U.S. and grow the American manufacturing economy as well. Some very pragmatic things that we can do. Uh, one example would be product warranty insurance for new products. These products that have no operating history, uh, the reason that the underwriting of the warranties and insurance products for warranties is so very difficult is precisely because of that lack of operating history coupled to a less than enormous balance sheet because you haven't grown to that scale yet. But the federal government, arguably, may have that balance sheet. Uh, so could we have a federal backstop of warranty insurance for new products? And it would, it would look like this. You talk to the insurance industry. You figure out statistically in a particular technology thread how much data they need to be able to underwrite a particular financial product to support the growth of that product and the companies that produce that product. And you backstop the warranty during the period in which that data is being collected. At the end of that time period, you hand it off to private industry. So it's a public-private partnership. In solar, that might look like three or four years of support federally to backstop a 25-year warranty. But at year three or four, it's now in the hands of private insurance industry who are soothed by the mathematics and statistics of the data from years zero, one, and two. So very, very low cost way to go. Uh, we've done a number of modeling exercises and found that uh, the return on investment is anywhere from four to 10x. So this pays itself off on an annual basis in a few months. So in an era where we're trying to be fiscally prudent and financially conservative, this kind of policy uh, would be really helpful to kickstart the industry. A perfect place for that would be in a green bank. Uh, the ex and folks have asked, you know, is there any federal precedent for this? Yes, there's the crop insurance mm -hmm. uh, that the Department of Agriculture has put out. There's the credit subsidy risk insurance the XM Bank has put out. Uh, there's, a, there's a number of federal programs that have shown effectiveness and return on investment arguments, which we could 
learn from and develop for the clean uh, energy economy in a way that really would stimulate manufacturing growth in the US. The other thing we could do is slightly tune federal policy in ways that make enormous differences for smaller companies but barely impact the federal financing. And what do I mean by that? Well, you may all have heard about this 48C tax credit uh, about a year ago, almost a year and a few months. And there was a lot of you know, self-congratulations by folks, some of whom are in this room, that this was a fantastic policy because the metric for success was defined as oversubscription. It was 3x oversubscribed, so therefore it was successful. Well, if you travel out to Silicon Valley and you talk to the companies that received those 48C tax credits, no one has been able to monetize a single penny. So why is that? Two reasons. First of all, any company that's building up Factory One, as Arun's pointed out, or Factory N, is spending hundreds of millions of dollars to do so. And you've got so much net operating loss accrued that the ability to use that tax credit directly is several years downstream. The other way to monetize it is to sell it to a third party. Selling it to a third party you know, has some arcane tax structure, which we needn't get into in this forum. But the critical aspect that uh, was not properly addressed uh, by Congress was uh, the five-year credit recapture period. And that single term has killed the monetization of the tax credits by any company that's at a scale that really needs them. Because we go to a third party and say, we would like to sell you this tax credit. And the third party will say, well, how do I know you're going to be around in five years as a partner? If, the, if you go away in year 4.99999, the tax credit goes to zero. Mm -hmm. So the only way I can do the deal with you is if you give me a letter of credit for the full value of the tax credit. <laughs> well, that doesn't quite work because not only... <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, if, if the, if the five-year credit capture period was waived for companies under a certain scale as measured by production output, as measured by revenues, whatever the right metric might be, that would enormously enable already allocated funds in a way that can actually stimulate the economy now. At a, at a more meta level, no one talked to any of us in Silicon Valley about this tax credit before it was structured. So it was a very, very well thought out application process, really looked at greenhouse gas emission abatement, uh, life cycle analysis, you know, financial growth. It, it was very comprehensive, but it didn't address the operating needs of small companies that actually would use it. So a takeaway message is talk to us. <laughs> <laughs> He's right here, Tim. Uh, Tim, I know you have some thoughts on, on this as well in terms of what, you know, what sort of policy gaps and whether it's green banks, things like that, that can hopefully solve some of these sure. problems. Well, first of all, um, I think I really think Brian's point is a very good one about looking at both supply side efficiency and demand side efficiency. Um, there's, they're both important. Um, and I would add a third part because it sometimes literally slips through the cracks, but that is when we think about the overall energy system, transmission, transmission and distribution efficiency, it's an area um, that we as a company have invested a lot in through our smart grid business, our digital energy business. Um, and we're investing a lot in the software to manage grids that will help make it more efficient. So I think if we think about supply side, demand side, and delivery uh, efficiency, and we really look, look at the entire package, and we should not just incentivize the demand side, but incentivize the entire system, um, that's one point. A couple of specific things. Um, we, uh, Bruce talked a little bit about the, uh, the recommendation for a clean energy standard. Uh, the Senate Energy and Natural Resources Committee has been looking at that idea, has actually solicited public comments on it, and um, so far has not moved toward legislation. But that's one idea, one way that you would actually be able to put forward a, um, a national policy that would actually create the certainty that we've all talked about, the long-term commitment and certainty that we've all talked about. It's not necessarily the only way to go, but it is one of the only ideas that's out there that has been clearly defined or has been somewhat defined and which uh, could provide that basis. So I think that's, that's an element that's really important. Um, tax credits, uh, obviously we're in a time where everything that uh, scores negatively from a budget sense is under intense scrutiny. Um, but I do think that a lot of these renewable tax credits create w way more in terms of total tax revenues than they cost. They probably actually don't really cost anything. 
and, um, and they need to be looked at closely because the negative implications of allowing them to expire without some equally efficient and effective alternative are, are devastating to everything we're talking about here. And then the last couple of things I want to mention because the report also does talk about the export opportunities and the fact that building a strong U.S. economy can help us in the, in the clean energy area, can help, help us become an export superpower. There is legislation on the Hill right now to um, renew uh, XM Bank. That actually is extremely important and hasn't really, so far, you know, our clean energy industry hasn't gotten mm -hmm. strong enough to do a lot of exporting. But the potential is certainly there. And without an XM Bank, we're facing competition from other countries that do have export <coughs> credit agencies, and it would be very difficult. And then, as a general matter, I think as there's a lot that can be done with new free trade agreements. There's uh, three free trade agreements that are now on the Hill for approval. All of them actually have good clean energy language in there. It's kind of sprinkled throughout, but they're, they're all actually uh, pro-environmental in many ways. And new negotiations are going on, for instance, in the Trans-Pacific Partnership. And there's a real effort to look at environmental trade issues in that context. So uh, I think we need to be doing that. Even as we look at our domestic policies, we also need to be looking at how we create the uh, right international environment. Mm -hmm. And uh, Jim, maybe you could pick up on some of that, too. He mentioned uh, the XM Bank, uh, what kind of role that can play in, in getting some of the financing going. Yeah, no, no, I'm glad we, we brought the theme back to yeah. export, which is what Bruce began with. Because I, that's, that's what we see, I guess, in the, in the banking world. We see the U.S. domestic market is really quite nascent, but a, a global opportunity that is, that is massive and in some ways a lot more mature and forward thinking in their policies. And the Exim Bank in particular, I think you're, you're right, it's because the, the, the domestic base here has been smaller for export, but it is growing. I think if you look at the, the amount of Exim loans, Exim Bank loans that we've seen over the last three years, it's probably doubled mm -hmm. each year in the past couple of years, and it's likely to double again in terms of their commitment of capital. It's a relatively small overall asset base. But I can give you multiple examples where um, $10 million here in a loan guarantee $20 million there, $50 million really provided some of that bridge capital, not, not so much at the early stage, but at that second stage of going from commercial plant one up to the, the next level, at least providing some bridge capital as the, uh, the technology has improved. So I think the, the Exim Bank is, is a really nice model for how that, how that can be done. I also think that we have to do a better job unleashing the private capital. A tremendous amount of money has been raised in infrastructure funds looking for either high single digit or low double digit returns. And, and, and I, I, don't, I don't think we want to get into, into a debate on the arcane tax policies that have encouraged tax equity to be the financing source for large um, uh, wind and solar um, utility scale plants. But there's something that doesn't seem intuitively right when you're just sort of selling the investment to someone who has a, you know, a, who's getting a tax benefit and maybe completely unrelated to the industry or doesn't have an expertise versus actually incentivizing infrastructure funds who want to be long-term 25, 30-year-old energy, 30-year energy owners. And um, so I think there's, there's work to be done on how we harness the private infra infrastructure capital. And I think there's also costless ways of thinking about our export policy. Many of the alternative energy companies have management teams, and Brian, you can speak to this, who are under a lot of stress just raising capital for their build-outs. For them to have to travel to, you know, to you know, South Africa one week, Bangladesh the next, they, they don't have the global sales channels of a, of a Schneider's or a Siemens or a GE's. And what we're finding increasingly as we move into this mature or second stage of alternative energy, that um, not only do they have capital problems, they simply have management problems and resources problems to reach global markets. And I don't know how, I think there may be a policy solution there where you can help channel how people are connecting with these markets, because these are not traditional connections. It's, you know, when it's, it's selling bio you know, mass to the UK. It's selling, as I said, solar um, process skills to uh, South Africa. And there, there are new channels being built, mm -hmm. and, the, uh, we're, and the, the new markets are really those where uh, people haven't thought of, because you know, solar is great in great insulation areas. Mm -hmm. And it's not about just where your labor population is. It's where the sun shines best. Uh, <laughs> wind is in places like the upper Midwest and parts of the world we never thought of. 
there's tremendous opportunities in Chile where it rains, you know, one week a decade, but they have massive mining operations that uh, where you know you can sell, you know, uh, renewable energy at 10 or 11 cents a kilowatt hour without subsidy. And there's, and so it, it really takes a different mindset in thinking about what are the new global sales channels that have been created by these new industries, because the uh, the sourcing of the feedstock is different mm -hmm. than we've dealt with before. And I think government and, and policy support can play a, uh, play a role. And, and certainly, um, and I'll go back to the incumbency theme, which, which I don't think people emphasize enough, is that if you're going to support electric vehicles or natural gas vehicles, you know, there's a big chicken and egg problem. Mm -hmm. uh, you have to think about whether a single policy statement should be on the table that really, you know, requires or mandates some usage because when you have, you know, 100,000 filling stations, they're not going to go to EVs or NGVs in, you know, one year or five <laughs> years, not even 10 years. It's a big commitment. Right. Um, and so I, I think the, uh, the incumbency issue needs to, to get more attention. We have some time to take some questions from the audience. If you can identify yourself and uh, if you direct it towards certain panelists, let us know as well. I guess right there first. <coughs> My name is Martin Apple. I'm uh, president of the Council of Scientific Society Presidents. I think the future of the country depends on our ability to nurture and capture creativity. And I think as I look across this spectrum from embracing risk to being risk averse as we keep moving down the line here, I'm wondering about the future and how do we get capital built again the way venture capital originally was in which entrepreneurs who had made money started investing it in other entrepreneurs who were trying to start companies. And that was the seed money that built what we have now in venture capital is mezzanine financing in which they skip the seed stage because they're risk adverse. And as we're in a down economy, they're even more risk averse. So what incentives can you see that would rebuild the seed capital for the beginning entrepreneurs, the creative people who we need to nurture? Sure. So when Nanosolar was started, our first 10 uh, angel investments came from 10 successful entrepreneurs in Silicon Valley who all put in small amounts of money. This was in the nuclear winter of funding back in you know, late 2001, early 2002. So it was a big deal to pull out a checkbook and sign it for any value other than zero. And uh, for them to do that, I think it speaks to your point, which is well taken, that uh, entrepreneurs have to help other entrepreneurs from an angel funding perspective. I do think in the valley that exists, uh, it, much less so in the rest of the US. Uh, and I think uh, connecting people from one innovation region to another and uh, uh, really emulating best practices is the way to do that. So folks who might be in the you know, research triangle in North Carolina need to see culturally how entrepreneurs help each other at the early angel stage. Also, there is a set of venture capital funds which specialize in early stage investments, uh, and they do a superb job at vetting those companies for the kind of risk profiles they're willing to do. But many VCs, as you say, don't specialize in that era. So um, I think that a lot of entrepreneurs think of venture capital as a monolithic block, but it's actually a portfolio of risks, uh, risk profiles as well. And some venture capital firms have in their mission statement to accept a certain level of risk for a certain expected return and others are different. And so you need to target, we as entrepreneur, entrepreneurs need to target our pitches at the early stages to the venture firms that can embrace that level of risk and have done so historically well. Okay. Um, we have a Twitter town hall question. Yes, we have a question <laughs> so from well Twitter present. from Taryn Norris from Americans for Energy Leadership. He's wondering, what's America's comparative advantage over China in the clean economy? Anyone want to grab that? <laughs> is there one? Well, <laughs> there, yeah, there is. There's several. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, yeah. Well, uh, maybe. Oh, sorry. He's he's here apparently. Discussion about how we need to create stronger domestic markets. I think we can all appreciate that. But we can also recognize the United States will never have as large an energy market as China. So how do we just consume more energy in the United States? What is the U.S.'s comparative advantage compared to China? Okay. Well, go ahead. Let me. I'll I'll take a stab at it and let Jim say some words too. Um, I think, first of all, the U.S. 
um, we've just already talked about innovation. So I think you need to start with innovation as the area where the U.S. has uh, tremendous capability. And, um, but I wouldn't finish there. Um, manufacturing, we do not need to accept that we are not capable of being competitive in manufacturing. In fact, um, GE, I mean, just looking at our own company, we have actually been investing in additional manufacturing in the United States. We've added about 15,000 U.S. jobs in manu uh, 15,000 U.S. jobs, 6,800 of them have been in manufacturing in the last uh, 10 years or so. So we're continuing to invest here, and we see the newest U.S. manufacturing as quite competitive globally, or we wouldn't be doing it if it wasn't competitive globally. So I don't think that we should assume that um, that the U.S. can't be competitive. Uh, and, I, and our whole previous conversation does lead back to the things that have to be done to be competitive in the clean energy area. Um, but innovating and adopting best manufacturing practices are the two things that we know we can do if we have the markets. Yeah, I, I, it, it, it's innovate. The level of innovation that takes place in the United States is, is just is simply it's just it's multiple times what what we see um, elsewhere. Um, the engineering and process skills here, um, which I think are increasingly in, important, and also we don't we don't look at all manufacturing as just a lump. I mean, there mm -hmm. there's there's some manufacturing certainly which lower end commoditized very it's cost it's very it adds very little value to the overall chain what we're focused on are the more complex elements of the supply chain where really technology innovation education um, is quite important and also the, the, you have to think about the pools of capital that are formed in the US you know th there are venture capitalists who have been burned in, in alternative energy but it is a very sophisticated venture capital community um, there's also um, a large network of what we call sort of family offices, high net worth groups, which have really, uh, who are very focused and are looking for differentiated strategies that we have found quite supportive of alternative energy. I, I see the, um, the, the Chinese for now are, are really pretty heavily reliant still on um, direct government loans and provincial support. They have massive hurdles of their own. Um, the jury is still out in terms of their own efficient allocation and whether they need 80 turbine manufacturers when the rest of the world has decided we really only need about 10, um, and whether we need hundreds of solar panel manufacturers, whether we need polysilicon coming out of every single town. I mean, it just, <laughs> there are, I would not, I think, the, I think there, uh, the, we are in the first inning of the, the green economy. Yeah, and I right. think, um, at least from my, my standpoint, uh, is that I rarely go to China anymore. It's really just traveling around the country to the various centers and, uh, and trying to identify those bankable ideas to help, as we said at the beginning, Brian. Sure. I, I would say, I mean, the, the question was about competitive advantage with China. Number one, I'm a recovering professor. <laughs> Spent a lot of years at Berkeley. I would say our system of higher education, the university system, the national lab system, we have the, the head of Oak Ridge National Lab right out here. That is a very, very unique thing. And that is, number one, our competitive advantage. We should not, never, never uh, underestimate the power of that human capital that we create out here. The United States has always, always in its history, have been able to attract the best talent from around the world. And we should, I'm a beneficiary of that. We should continue to do that. Other nations are not like that. And we have always attracted talent out here. And and unleash them in this ecosystem of higher education and national labs, et cetera. We have to do that. We, keep, we have to continue doing attracting talent because there'll be a talent competition at some point. We will never be able to compete with China in terms of number of people. <laughs> I think that's fair to say. <laughs> we should be able to compete with them in the number of good ideas. And from my vantage point, I get to see some of the best ideas around the country, I can tell you. I'm extremely optimistic about the ideas that are coming out from a university, startup companies, national labs, et cetera. This is amazing stuff. And we sort of beat ourselves a little bit. Oh, we, we're getting, you know, we're not. No. This is, we are the best right now. Now, if you look at the China five, Chinese five-year plan, you'll find that they are looking at our playbook and said, we need to figure, f focus on innovation. Great. That's great. That's a little bit of competition. Wonderful. 
And what we should be doing is looking at their market and seeing how do we take this, you know, this innovation ecosystem out there, out here, unleash that with manufacturing and all, and look at the global market and our local market. So that's the kind of thing that we need to plan out. And if we play our books, play our game right, use our own playbook in the right way, we can compete. Pantip, go ahead. Innovation uh, is often defined by many of us as the technologies that drive new product creation. But another way America can stay competitive with China and other countries is to have innovation be a, a central feature of the manufacturing environment. In other words, in China or other countries, how do you compete with a US product? You do it at lower cost with manual labor. Manual labor often leads to lower quality products, throwaway products and so forth, which are ultimately not very green and <coughs> they're being uh, used for very short periods of time. So their, their embedded cost is actually much higher than what they're actually sold for. So having high production volume, <coughs> low cost but high quality innovative manufacturing technologies is another way to compete. And at the federal level, if we encourage that, that's very important. There was a program um, in the DOD called Mantech at one point, a manufacturing technology program that, that <coughs> spoke to that. And uh, the DOD today is a very uh, strong advocate of that. In fact, I would encourage whoever in, isn't from that Michigan entrepreneurial company doing foundry, clean foundry development to talk to the DOD uh, and see what you could do for them. I think that'd be a really important funding source. I'm happy to speak with you as well. Uh, but the, the folks uh, that are thinking about innovation purely at the technology level, uh, I think if we can expand that definition to embrace manufacturing, we can stay competitive globally using that same entrepreneurial spirit, using the national labs, using the academic institutions, and really penetrate the cost structure that lets us stay globally competitive on a sustained basis. We're running a bit behind, so we have time for one more question, right? I guess the end of I'm Sandy Apgar from Baltimore. About the built environment, and specifically uh, ARPA-E, if I have that right, uh, and as an alumnus of DOD, um, is there a priority, a project, a program for the built environment, and particularly for the process of producing and managing the built environment? We have a huge sector of the economy, roughly 20%, but highly inefficient because of history and policy and structure. And uh, I never thought, frankly, until this morning that a center of excellence of innovation intellectually in your unit could do for that aspect of the built environment what actually DOD and others have done uh, in other respects and uh, produce enormous breakthroughs if you could focus on or would on process, not just products? Well, let me wear my bigger hat than just RPE hat as representing the Department of Energy. I should say, before I even say that, um, that before I came to the DOE, I, in fact, testified in front of the Senate on exactly this particular issue on buildings and how to reduce energy consumption in buildings and the built environment as a whole. The Department of Energy has, if you look at the there's a buildings program um, that has invested significantly in the R&D, but not just R&D in the demonstration, getting the financing, et cetera, the Better Buildings Initiative. There is, a, it, as, as you know, it is a very fragmented industry um, in, for the built environment. You needed some, uh, uh, the ability, this is where the federal government can be a convener in many ways. Uh, there's a buildings energy innovation hub that is there in Pennsylvania, but it's actually nationwide, but it's based in the Navy Yard in Philadelphia. If you ever get a chance, go there and see what, what's going on. Um, and you need, you have a microgrid out there, the buildings, et cetera. Uh, so there's a lot of activity going on in this area, and it is an area where, and it uses 75% of the electricity. So we, we have to make it much more efficient. Um, in the RPE side, we looked at what the rest of the DOE is doing and say, where is the white space, if you may, that the RPE could focus on? And that's a partnership between RPE and the rest of DOE. And we focused on, you know, so we saw lighting program already there that has been covered by the rest of the Department of Energy. We focused on HVAC uh, because that is, you know, 40, heating and cooling is about 40, 50% of the building uh, energy consumption. And we found that we are a factor of 10 away from the theoretical limit in air conditioning. And I know uh, we have been using air conditioning since Carrier, 1928. But 
we said that instead of making incremental improvement in the compressor or the desiccant and things like that, let's take a quantum leap and put the target as the, in a factor of 10, let's put a factor somewhere in between. And we call, call that program, beat it. <laughs> Building energy efficiency through integrated thermal devices. <laughs> so beat the target. And what you get is, you know, you, you get scientists and engineers excited. So here's a challenge, here's some money, go for it. And you find innovation then. Competition is a good thing in that respect. And we're finding amazing innovation of you know, rem removing humidity from the air and then cooling it so that you don't have the latent heat load. I won't go into the technical details. But to fair to say, amazing innovation coming out to reduce the energy consumption, to reduce the greenhouse effect of hydrofluorocarbons. This is a huge effect, about 2,000 times more than CO2, the, the uh, refrigerants, and at cost. The cost is very important. So there's a lot of, so stay tuned in that one. I'll give you more updates if you want. Okay. I think we learned one thing in this panel is that RPE is great at coming up with acronyms. <laughs> <laughs> That's the Friday evening happy hour. <laughs> uh, I want to thank the panel for, for really a very valuable and excellent conversation. <laughs> and uh, our next, our next panel discussion is going to be uh, looking at the clean economy by regions, and it's going to be led by Mark Miro, who's a Brookings Senior Fellow and Policy Director at the Metropolitan Policy Program, who really helped put together the research for, for this paper. Uh, so I'll leave it to him. All right. Good. That was enjoyable. Enjoyed your comments? I'm, whoops, I'm walking off. <laughs>
let's uh, come, uh, let we, let's reconvene. Uh, if you are marooned in one of the overflow rooms, come back. Uh, if you hustle, you could probably ace someone else out of their seat. Uh, <laughs> but uh, there is there are a few seats, so feel free to uh, consolidate it in here. Um, so well, I, I'm. Uh, it, we've, we've heard some assessments now of how portions of the clean economy are doing from the Department of Energy uh, and individual private sector uh, actors. Um, it was a promising but I think decidedly mixed uh, picture, I think of great uh, opportunity, uh, you know, a palpable sense of uh, energy and uh, optimism, but also discussions of a fairly mixed or blurry policy environment at the national level. Uh, but now I, it's time to drill down into U.S. regions, into the metropolitan areas where the clean economy is growing and changing in diverse ways, different in every location. I'm Mark Murrell, Senior Fellow uh, and Policy Director here at the Brookings Metropolitan Policy Program, uh, and, and the lead with Jonathan Rothwell uh, on the Sizing the Clean Economy Project. And what I'd like to do now is lead a kind of another kind of Google Earth expedition uh, down into a few more of the nation's regions, somewhat akin to Bruce's, uh, uh, but this time uh, via people. Uh, so we can assess the growth in, in regions, hear what regional actors are doing to facilitate it, and consider what federal and state policy needs they have. Uh, why do we care so much about regions in our report and seek to you know, insert them into uh, clean economy growth discussions. Well, the reason is really hidden in plain sight. Uh, regions and the regional ind industry clusters they contain are absolutely critical focuses because they accelerate innovation. They promote entrepreneurship, enhance job creation. Regions are the places where, given the policy context set by Washington and in state capitals that research is conducted, technologies are developed, ideas are shared, new businesses started, Regions are places where markets are tested, deals done, projects cited, workers trained, workers signed up for new jobs, suppliers located, and all the rest. And in fact, our research, one of, one of the strong takeaways is that clustered, uh, concentrated uh, establishments simply grew faster than more isolated ones at the regional level. So there's now uh, you know, uh, an empirical basis for this you know, claim we've been making. So, in the, and this underscores, we believe, the need to focus much more on what's happening on the ground in diverse, specific regions as we assess the progress of the clean economy in the U.S. So with those thoughts in mind, uh, I'd like to introduce and stage a conversation here among four you know, truly outstanding, varied, and yet in their own way representative actors in U.S. regional clean economies. We've heard from some firms. Uh, we've heard from an innovative uh, government agency, RPE. It's time to hear from some leaders whose diverse organizations are on the front lines of advancing the growth of the clean economy around the country, but in varied ways. So along those lines, I'd like to introduce our four panelists. Uh, first, Dr. Tom Mason, uh, immediately to my left, your right, is the director of the Oak Ridge National Laboratory near Knoxville, Tennessee. And in that capacity, he can speak for the role of major innovation institutions in local economies. Uh, in other cities or regions, it's a major university. Uh, uh, can be other uh, sorts of institutions, but this is Oak Ridge National Laboratory in Knoxville, Tennessee. Rebecca Bagley is president and CEO of Nortec, a regional nonprofit technology-based economic development organization serving 21 counties in Northeast Ohio. And really multiple metropolitan areas networked together. She's leading group, uh, efforts there to develop a series of advanced technology roadmaps to accelerate growth in, in that region across advanced uh, technology industries. Um, Jim Waring, uh, for his part, is uh, the chairman and board of, uh, of the board and co-founder of Cleantech San Diego, really one of the nation's preeminent clean economy cluster uh, organizations. It's a specifically cluster-focused initiative. And then finally, uh, to the far end, Francis Murray is the president and CEO of the New York State Energy Research and Development Authority, NYSERDA, one of the nation's largest and most sophisticated state energy offices. Transforming the New York State economy with the special attention to the economies of regions is the central part of NYSERDA's state mission. So with that, I'm going to ask each uh, of the panelists 
a few questions, maybe two rounds. Let's try to keep our answers compact so then we have time for a little more uh, dynamic interaction. Then we'll open this out into a more interactive discussion, questions from you in the audience and you in the Twitter sphere. Uh, is that a word? I'm not sure. <laughs> Uh, or watching online. And don't you could tweet your questions to our event hashtag, clean econ, or mail them to Metro Q at Brookings EDU. But Tom, I want to uh, start with you and, and ask you to briefly uh, review the ways in which Oak Ridge National Laboratory is not just a national laboratory, but uh, a part of the clean economy innovation system in the Knoxville region. And give us a sense of the value you think you're adding to the local regional economy. And I, I'm interested here because I think labs are sometimes viewed as somewhat aloof uh, institutions. The Department of Energy certainly hasn't had a, a deep history of uh, regional uh, economic development. And yet I think there's a very different story in Knoxville. So uh, perhaps give us a sense of the value add and the participation in your region. Well, Oak Ridge is a science and energy lab. We're a rich resource of, you know, a broad range of fundamental science to more engineering application focused work that, that relates to uh, energy. And obviously as a national lab, we interact with companies large and small all over the country. Um, the promises we make to the uh, U.S. taxpayer in order to get our funding are based on some outcome in society. And that only becomes real when the private sector takes the products to market. Now what we find is even though we're interacting all across the company, there's an awful lot that just happens locally for very natural reasons. We have no particular preference to our region, no matter how you define that, you call it the southeast, the state of Tennessee, right. or the Knoxville area. Right. Uh, but it really is a human endeavor. There's a huge piece of, of those activities with tech transfer, spin-up companies, collaborative research that requires just person-to-person -person contact. And that does tend to happen locally. And um, one of the other hats I wear is I'm, I'm chairman of an organization called Innovation Valley Inc., which is a regional economic development activity that, that brings together the multiple jurisdictions surrounding Oak Ridge, uh, the, the, the more urban areas, Knoxville, some of the rural areas in the surrounding counties, Roan County and so forth, uh, to try and draw on the assets that we share as a region. Um, and, and when we put together the strategy for Innovation Valley, one of the things we did was say, what are those assets? We actually had the Battelle Technology Group come in and do an inventory. And not surprisingly, what we found was a lot of them tied to this clean energy, clean economy that we're now talking about. And uh, it wasn't just Oak Ridge National Lab, it's the Tennessee Valley Authority, the University of Tennessee, and those institutions all have associated with them a set of people who are working on these problems, they're engaged in them. And uh, even if it's not necessarily technology that may have been developed in the lab, oftentimes you find it's people who somewhere in their career, whether as a student uh, having an educational experience or, or during some period of employment came through the lab. And, and tho those people are the resource for companies that are trying to grow and relocate. And, and that's been part of our strategy in talking about what we do as a region. Great. Great. Um, Beck, let's hear a little about what Nortech is and does and how it aids and abets the emergence of clean economy growth in your region. And, you know, I think, a, uh, you know, a sub-question is, you know, won't these firms emerge and grow themselves? You know, what is, again, the special addition of Nortech to, to the 21 county uh, region? Aids and abets makes it sound like some kind of illegal activity or something. <laughs> but, um, so <laughs> Nortech, as I mentioned, covers 21 counties uh, in Northeast Ohio. And um, that, just to, to place people in that, it's, it's Akron, Cleveland, Youngstown, Lorraine. Those are some of the, the major metropolitan areas within that geography. So it is, you know, metropolitan areas sort of linked together with, um, with a nice rural base in there as well. Um, we do our work through regional innovation clusters. Um, we have a methodology that we've developed that has um, many different facets, uh, whether it's different programs that we're running or things that we um, are, are leading. Uh, the cluster members towards, and, and what I mean by clusters, I mean everybody understands that definition, but basically I break it down into large and small companies, universities, workforce, and funders to drive a, um, a specific industry faster 
uh, and with more information. And so we're focusing our cluster model right now on two emerging areas uh, in Northeast Ohio, advanced energy and flexible electronics. Um, again, we look at it through the lens of, of really what do we do individually with those companies. So we really have a hands-on approach. We have several different um, uh, programs or, or just high-touch um, efforts that we do to make sure that we're working individually with our cluster members to understand what their needs are, their technologies, give them access to markets and funding that they may have challenges um, to on their own. Then we also look at a regional um, strategy. So this is where we deploy the roadmaps that are um, highlighted in the Brookings report. And basically the road mapping methodology that, that we've developed is a hybrid of other types of roadmaps and it looks at what's the global market opportunity and I think that's really important. It starts with what's the market opportunity. And we did them, I'll use energy storage as an example because we got very specific. So we looked at the 20 systems that can store energy and we went back to the core and enabling parts and, and integration that goes into those systems. We said, okay, what are our assets? What are the companies? What's the, um, what's the research that happens within our region in all of those areas? And then we, built, we brought the cluster members together and we said, based on this information, what are our best opportunities over the next seven years based on the assets that we have today? And we picked five uh, systems in energy storage. And interestingly enough, there was people who represented other sy systems within energy storage in that room, but they decided as a collective that we wanted to drive based on our assets, understanding that you know, our assets could shift and change over time. Um, so we then competitively benchmarked and, and came up with um, what's the seven-year plan look like, how many jobs, and by the way, across all three energy sectors that we focused on in these roadmaps, 50, we expect 5,200 jobs to be created over seven years. Um, and then we also backed up into an action plan. So this is also where we come in and, and sort of, and that defines what we're doing at the company level, sometimes at the regional level, and, and even at the national level. And this action plan helps to define what we're going to do, what the cluster members feel responsibility for, and that's an 18-month action plan, and we sort of roll that out. So this methodology has really helped to come up with the regional component. How do we drive our strategy based on, and when I say our, it's the region strategy. It's not Nortec strategy. I mean, the industry and research members um, probably spent about 20 hours um, in meetings over the course of the last three to four months, um, you know, individually with these teams developing these roadmaps. So it was an impressive um, effort uh, okay. that they put into it. And then one last um, uh, part is, you know, I talked about the interaction with the companies, the region, and then the national is extremely important. So how do we make sure that our region is thought of as a leader, in this case, in advanced energy, um, that our companies are promoted um, and our research facilities are promoted throughout the country to help bring them resources. And we really look at it like that, you know, to be able to participate in things like Brookings, to be able to, um, you know, meet with national media in New York and to be able to um, bring federal resources back in and affect policy at the federal level. So it sounds like you're creating a kind of uh, collective action uh, focus in a region among a cloud of companies. Yeah. That the uh, uh, Jim, uh, Cleantech San Diego is a membership trade association working with, you know, a really diverse, dynamic set of clean tech clusters you know, in Southern California and almost blurring into uh, across the border into Mexico. I mean, when we talk a little bit about uh, the, the dimension of, of lo lower cost manufacturing really, really being accessible to your region. But so what's your role in, as, a, as a particular trade association oriented cluster initiative uh, and quarterback in that region. And, and by the way, I, you know, we appreciate your support of this work, though I know you feel our numbers may be a little low for, for to, to describe the full richness of your region. But uh, well, uh, Mark, thank you. Thank you for the opportunity to be here. Um, let me speak to your second point first. Very briefly, uh, Cleantech's approximately four years old, and we've really worked very hard to study and drill into our database. Uh, began about three and a half years ago with a study done by Global Connect that looked at what was the clean tech cluster in the community. And then through the work of our board and particularly Glenn Mosier of our board, we've worked very hard to keep that up. So, so when we looked at your numbers, we did notice discrepancies. 
uh, and, and, we know, and we believe the numbers are substantially higher. But more significantly and more positively, it, it points to what Bruce was saying. It was a very difficult task in measuring. So what we've been very appreciative of is that Brookings team has said, okay, let's work together. Let's understand your methodology and our methodology so that we come up with accurate numbers. Now that's not important for San Diego necessarily, but what it's important for is we've seen, talked about here this morning, national policy is critical. So the, so the critical mass of this, of this space is critical. So if by working together we come up with better definitions and more refined numbers, my instincts tells me we're gonna come up with a much larger population of, of clean tech jobs, and therefore that will facilitate the policy. So we look forward to working with you on that in the future. Uh, and then as far as what does Clean Tech San Diego do, uh, again, we're a nonprofit trade organization that was formed in recognition or in a belief that the world is gonna change the way we provide, deliver, manufacture goods and services. We, we have to change if we're gonna to continue to maintain a quality of life. And this is gonna to have to be done and led by the private sector working on a set of government policies. This can happen anywhere in the world, so why not San Diego? So let's, let's come and compete in San Diego and take advantage of our culture of innovation that, uh, that led to the telecommunication cluster in town, to the bio, biotechnology cluster in town. Let's do the same thing. So we're really a connective tissue, if you will, between the public sector, state and local government, primarily, uh, in, in our great universities, and there are over 70 research institutes in San Diego, and our private sector company. Uh, and how do we do that? Well, one example is, let me introduce one of my colleagues, Jason Anderson, who's here in the audience. Jason's here with some colleagues from around the country and is gonna spend the next two or three days on Capitol Hill talking to representatives and their aides about energy policy matters or policy matters. Another way we are able to do it, again, is a cluster because we have some critical mass. Just within the last month, we had Robert uh, Weisenmiller, who is the new chairman of the California uh, CEC, California Energy Commission, was in town. We were able to have the chairman meet with some Clean Tech San Diego members uh, and talk about what are the issues that they are facing on the ground that have regulatory ramifications at the CEC very firsthand. We were also allowed the chairman to see the microgrid at UCSD, which is one of the great research laboratories in the world. They have a 42 megawatt demand on campus. They're producing 82% of that from renewables. And it's a, but it's a living laboratory. They test things, what works, what doesn't, how do you do man response. And, it's, and, and so, it, so he was able to see that and get a lot of ideas about what's going on and what are the private companies interfacing with that. Then last, last Friday, uh, Mark Farron, who is a new appointment to the California Public Utility Commission, spent an entire day in town. And we had a series of meetings where Mark was able to meet with representatives of our primary clusters, which are electric vehicles, uh, algae biofuels, solar, uh, energy efficiency, and smart grid. So we're able to get people in the business face-to-face -face with significant regulatory persons in order to e e exchange ideas. So that, and, and that's just indicative. But we really think of it as connective tissue because in, the, in reality, you have great research institutes that are complex organizations that work very hard, but they're not necessarily insular, but they're complex in their day-to-day -day work. We have a very involved public utility, San Diego Gas and Electric, big complex organization, but with a very aggressive plan for uh, uh, renewable energy. And then you've got these private sector companies that want to play in that space. But, the, but in and of themselves, they, there's not the systems for communication. We're the system of communication. So you're a convening, convening point, uh, point of efficient uh, interaction. That, that absolutely. And then, and then we pick up from our members, again, the advocacy issues that, that you would expect any trade association to do. To do. So, so we, and, and that just creates a lot of energy, a lot of positive energy uh, in the community, and uh, uh, it's very additive to the community. Excellent. So let's, let's, look, let's turn to a state at a moment where I think you know, state houses and state policy are, you know, very much uh, uh, topmost in, in people's mind given, uh, you know, uh, clearly uh, a lack of uh, progress in, in Washington. Um, I mean, Francis, you lead essentially a state uh, government entity. Uh, can you fill us in on 
Nysurda's activities and role in the New York clean economy, and particularly how that intersects with regional economies. I mean, too often states, too, can become a top-down presence uh, in local economic systems, uh, and yet I, I have a sense that uh, Nysurda is uh, approaching its relationship with the diverse regions of New York in a quite different way. Great. Thank you, Mark. And, and it's Frank, by the way. My, my okay. mom gets to call me Frank, okay. but that's about it. <laughs> uh, we are, as Mark alluded to, we are not a, a state agency in the sense of the Department of Energy as a federal agency. Uh -huh. We are a public benefit corporation. We're still a create, creation of the state legislature, but be, by being a public authority under legal uh, statute, we have a great deal more flexibility in how we can respond and react and uh, invest in some of the things that we've been talking about here today. Our breath is pretty strong. I mean, I, uh, pretty broad. I, I run what I, th I think is a wonderful group of talented people whose responsibilities on one extreme run from trying to manage the uh, remnants of the only commercial nuclear fuel reprocessing facility ever to operate in this country in a, in a beautiful area just south of Buffalo. We've been engaged in cleaning up that site for 30 years to at one point in time being the largest issuer of public debt, uh, uh, tax-exempt debt in the United States back in the days when the utilities were engaged in investing through bonding authority in pollution control. We were the agency that did that. We still have some responsibilities in that regard, and that translates nowadays into some creative financing approaches with regard to energy efficiency and renewable energy technology. All the way over the other extreme, I chair the State Energy Planning Board, which means the analytical work that underlines much of the energy policy analysis in New York State is done my, by my policy folks. But in between is where what we're talking about today and where much of what we're engaged in today is, is, is all about. I have the privilege of having somewhere in the order of a 600 to $650 million a year budget. Much of that money goes into research and development, a traditional root of NYSERDA going back to its early days, but also increasingly so in the actual deployment of energy efficiency and renewable energy technology. And as we become engaged in that, you know, the horizon expands. So it's not just paying for the installation of solar panels on residential structures, or that is something we do do. It broadens into the whole opportunities presented by investment in energy efficiency and renewable energy. Really what we're trying to do is to create an economy that then produces jobs that put people back to work. And that's what every single state in this country is engaged in. And we certainly in New York State view investment in clean tech as an important part of our blueprint going forward. Uh, uh, so that's kind of the broad picture. In terms of your second question about uh, how we operate on a regional basis, uh, one of the best examples is the one that's highlighted in your publication. Uh, we were pleased to see you cite uh, the Albany, the capital district area, as the leading area in the country for clean tech. We were not surprised. Uh, we've been engaged in this for well over a decade. And the way it works, and what we talk a lot about, very much part of our, our corporate culture, even though we're a governmental entity, is this concept of partnership. We have some fairly progressive policies in New York State to support energy efficiency, renewable energy. And, and I would quibble with Bruce's comment this morning about California having the most aggressive renewable portfolio standard. I would argue that New York does. <laughs> we have a goal of 35% yeah. by the year 2015, I'm sorry, 30%, and on top of which we layer a 15% uh, target with regard to energy efficiency. Our policy objective is to have 45% of our electricity in New York State coming through a combination of investment in energy efficiency and renewable energy technology by the year 2015. So we have a number of governmental policies in place that are designed to support and encourage investment in the clean tech industry. But those governmental policies alone, even with all the resources that I have available, is not going to create what's happened in Albany. What you also need, and again, Albany is an excellent example, is you need to capitalize upon the intellectual capital in our academic uh, sector. Um, the, 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 much of the, the early work in, in the Albany area centered around the State University at Albany and the development of the Nanotech College, which became a springboard for attracting additional investment in the capital district area and other technologies, and it continues to be. 
But in New York, it's just not the nanotech college. We're talking about you know, Ivy League institutions like Cornell and Columbia, but you're talking about you know, engineering institutions like RPI, Clarkson, but you work all the way at Syracuse University in central New York, but you work all the way down to the community college level, which may be the most important part of this whole academic um, um, uh, 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 panorama. But, but academia married to you know, private labs like the GE Research Lab you heard about earlier and the General Motors Fuel Cell Lab that we have in Honey Eye Falls, that's where the intellectual capital is. That's where the ideas are coming from. They're not necessarily coming from the folks that Nice Herder or my colleagues in state government as bright as we may think we are. But I'll also make the point, the most progressive governmental policies, the most uh, creative um, uh, ideas from academia are not going to produce one new job in New York State unless we do this in a way that we can attract investment by the private sector. And you heard the gentleman this morning from GE. I mean, 10 years ago, who would have believed that GE was going to build a brand new manufacturing facility in upstate New York, part of the Rust Belt, so to speak. But they're building a brand new battery manufacturing facility just down the street in Schenectady. Just north of Albany, the largest single private sector construction project in the country, Global Foundries, building a brand new chip manufacturing facility. That's not governmental funds, that's the private sector. And what we've been able to do in the Albany area is to bring together government, academia, and the private sector to create what you described, I think, so well in your report today. And we're looking to replicate that all across the state. We're looking to replicate it in building technologies in the Syracuse area. We're looking to do it in the Hudson River Valley with respect to solar technology. We've got some interesting things going on down in Long Island with regard to energy storage. So it's, it's kind of a mindset that we've brought to this whole process that government is part of the solution, but we don't have all the answers. And we need to work together successfully in partnership if we're going to be able to create this clean tech economy, which is a wonderful thing to have. But ultimately, what we're really talking about is putting people back to work which is the most important thing I think we can do for our economy as a state or as a nation right now. I find that I find extremely interesting to the uh, sense of variegation it seems like you see, a kind of differentiated approach region to region, uh, all, all in service of some particular strategies. Well, well, it's not that different from what Rebecca was describing in Northeast Ohio. You look to capitalize upon the unique strengths and Absolutely. resources and what works in Albany may not work in Syracuse for Ed or down in Long Island. You have to capitalize upon what you have where it is. So One of the single takeaways from our report is how many stories and different uh, realities there are in the region. What I want to do now is uh, 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 turn this to how each of you think things are going in your region economically very briefly and then uh, 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 ask you for a sense of the, the region focus uh, you know, particular policy or other uh, needs that uh, you think are missing pieces in the region. So, Tom, I mean, you know, obviously the Knoxville region, uh, uh, you know, obviously has had a, a pretty good decade uh, uh, in, these, in this space uh, with significant growth, according to our research, uh, in part due to Oak Ridge's own growth. But I'm wondering, what are the missing institutional or policy items now? I mean, I think the first panel described a degree of flux uh, and uncertainty, uh, certainly in national policy. Uh, so what, what, is, what, is, what, are you, what are the next, what would further crack the code in your region and sustain growth? Well, certainly uncertainty is a problem. Uh, I think for an area like Knoxville, access to capital it can, can be a problem. Uh, you know, I think there are lots of places in, in, around the country and around the world that say, well, it's not like Silicon Valley. And of course, the reason is there's probably nowhere quite like Silicon Valley. Uh, and that's, that's certainly true in, in our region. There, there isn't that same sort of tradition of risk taking and, and intellectual property can look a little bit intangible uh, to, to people mm -hmm. who may be more used to investing in assets that you can walk on and put your hands on. Um, I, I think that, uh, you know, one of the themes that, that you heard a lot in the previous session was the discussion around manufacturing. And, and I think that that is important. I mean, my own belief is that, that we're not going to have a vibrant economy if, if, you know, in some sense what we're doing is, you know, I'll cut your hair and, and you can uh, polish my shoes. We've actually got to, we've got to be making some things as well. And, and there's a whole set of policy levers that, that go into that in terms of how you enable uh, manufacturing and, and um, 
clean energy is, is as something that ties into the manufacturing center in a, in a very kind of direct way impacted by that. Uh, the, the investments in R&D that were discussed uh, and one of the highlighted recommendations in the report I, I really do think are important. There is a lot of debate, particularly at the federal level, about what's the appropriate government role. Mm -hmm. uh, obviously, national labs, universities, research institutions, they don't manufacture things, they don't sell things. That's not our role, but I think there is an appropriate federal role at the front end of the innovation spectrum. And uh, in the energy sector in particular, one of the things that I think we have suffered from is that uh, there isn't a lot of stability actually in the research environment. Even though research is a pretty long-term activity, and you might think that because of the long time horizons to go from the lab bench to a delivered product that you would have some stability in the research policy, what you've tended to find is that, that even in the research sector, there are flavors of the day that come and go with new administrations. And you know, if you've got a problem that's going to take 10 years to solve, uh, and you're on a two-year cycle moving in and out of favor, you know, getting 10 years over 30 years of on and off is not the same as a 10-year sustained effort. And that's why I think some of the models that are being talked about now, uh, like the energy innovation hubs, uh, there was one mentioned in, in, um, in Pennsylvania. Uh, we're involved in one that's focused on, on nuclear energy using high performance computing to really get very good models, predictive models that will enable power up rates and, and, and uh, better understanding of safety margins and so on. That's a model that allows for a fairly focused, reasonably sustained effort. Uh, the intent is that it's sort of five years with the possibility of, of another five years depending on, on how things are going. You know, you can, you can make significant progress on a very difficult research problem on that time scale. It's very hard to make progress in a research problem where you, you get part way into it and then, you know, the focus shifts. And, and if, you, if you look at the energy sector, you know, we, we, we do tend to see things you know, hydrogen is great, hydrogen is not great. And that's, that's very difficult when you're on the research end of things uh, to, to make that progress when, when the rug keeps getting pulled out. Very good. Um, I mean, Rebecca, clearly, uh, you know, your region is beginning to see some real traction in you know, manufacturing, production oriented uh, uh, end of this economy. The strength of smart grid, fuel cells, advanced batteries, wind, it's a pretty interesting uh, kind of evolution of the region's industrial past. Uh, I'm interested here. I mean, you've, sent, you've suggested some of what uh, uh, Nortec does and its value add, you know, where does that leave off, you know, and what is the appropriate division of labor then for federal and state uh, uh, engagement as well? What's been missing too? Yeah, I think that um, several things that, that come to mind when you talk about that. One of the things I didn't talk about in my opening is this connection with these emerging industries into the manufacturing base. And I think, you know, certainly with heavy manufacturing areas that becomes critical. And I think the good news coming out of the recession is that more and more manufacturers are ready to really commit to um, investment around product process and market innovation. And so if we're at the ready um, with these cluster you know, opportunities to be able to show a path to tie that into the manufacturing base, I think it really um, bodes well for, for economic growth. And, and that's one of the you know, we're working with our manufacturing extension partner in the region, Magnet, to be able to um, really have a high touch with those manufacturers. Um, from the perspective of uh, state and federal and, and uh, their role, obviously I think it's a, a huge role. Um, I think from a policy perspective and an incentive perspective, um, at the state government, we've been very lucky um, that we have the Ohio Third Frontier. The voters uh, last May just extended that $700 million over five years, a bond issue. 62% of the voters decided to extend that. And by the way, this is a technology commercialization university sort of looking to the future mm -hmm. um, program. And, um, and people felt enough hope in May of last year to, to be able to, to authorize the state to do 700 million in bonds for that. So I think that's huge. Um, our governor's in the midst of, of um, organizing with Patel actually is here, uh, an energy summit. 
uh, in September, and I think that'll be great. It'll bring leaders from around the country um, to start uh, really laying out what they're calling a comprehensive energy strategy for Ohio. And, um, you know, as I'm hoping that that will evolve in the way that it really is the way to tie energy development in with economic development. And, um, and that's, I think, the, the current um, thought process of, of our governor, which is, uh, you know, very helpful. And um, then, you know, a lot at the federal level, I mean, I agree with peop everything that people have said, so I'll bring up one other thing that, that I think is a real challenge in regional development, um, which is streamlining of capital into the regions and how we apply as a region, whether, whether we're talking about a, a company or a manufacturing strategy or, you know, an intermediary. I mean, it's just extremely cumbersome and there's no real, you know, in manufacturing, for instance, there's approximately 40 programs in about seven different agencies. Um, so if you want to come up with a comprehensive manufacturing strategy, it's managed by all of these different people, you know, so you have to sort of manage through that, whether, again, it's a company, a university, um, a, a region, like we would want to organize our region around that. So I think if we can figure out a way to, um, at a minimum, sort of have an overarching strategy at the federal government, but hopefully I would go one step further, which is breaking down some of the congressional and administration barriers to actually, you know, pool or make more flexible that money so that regions can, so you can do what we've been talking about, which is this bottoms up approach where regions can actually apply for the type of money that they need to further the economy. And then that becomes, um, an issue of, of really sort of this bottom-up growth as opposed to even the structure of the federal programs and incentives in some areas can, um, can sort of dictate how you're growing, so. Mm -hmm. Jim, what, what have been some of your good and even bad encounters with federal and state policy? I mean, it seems like you, you, know, you have significant momentum in San Diego. <laughs> yet there are certainly, uh, you know, background conditions that are suboptimal. So I'm interested, you know, what has worked uh, with higher levels of government and whatnot? Well, let me, let me talk first about, uh, and, and you started this session by saying what's positive and yeah. what's working. Uh, again, in the state of California, we do have a set renewable portfolio <laughs> standard. We have Assembly Bill 32, which sets some greenhouse gas limitations. And we have a, a assembly bill 375, which is a smart city. So we have this regulatory framework. Now, it's still being fleshed out, but it's on the books. And that has led to this sense of long-term policy, which leads to long-term investment. <laughs> and, a, and a classic example of that is just recently, Soytech, which is a French company, and they have a, a solar, uh, concentrated solar manufacturing arm, announced they're going to build a factory in San Diego that will employ 500 direct jobs, and that will be open by the end of next year. Now, why did they do that? They did that because they are providing the concentrated solar arrays for a solar farm that's going to be selling the power to SD, San Diego Gas and Electric as part of the renewable portfolio standard. And, and the nature of their factory is such that they're able to build it not only in the U.S., but in California which leads to another theme that's come up here. We give up too easily on manufacturing, and I think a number of, of speakers have said that. One of the solar companies in, in San Diego is called Sullivan Solar Power, and they're a design installer. Now, now they, they compete for every single job. They have 55 employees. They installed 6.5 megawatts of rooftop solar last year, and, and Daniel, who owns the company, will only bid using U.S. manufactured panels. <laughs> period. And he's competing with people that are bringing in the cheap stuff. And I said, well, how do you compete? He says, I'm, I'm, I'm more efficient and I'll work on lower margins. But the, but the point is, it can happen. We just kind of default to things. So, so I, I want to point that out. Another thing that's going on in town that's very positive is by the end of this year, San Diego will have 10% of the Nissan, uh, the Nissan Leafs in America. Now, Putting a few electric vehicles on the grid is no big deal. When you put bunches of electric vehicles on the <laughs> grid, it's a really big deal. Okay. I mean, we, and we've put together a consortium with the utility, with General Electric, with the city, UC San Diego, and, 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 uh, and Cleantech San Diego to study what does it really mean right. to put EVs on the market. Uh, the utility will tell you that if they just have to bolster their grid and infrastructure to accommodate the EVs, that's a $7 billion CapEx. 
So what we're trying to study is real-time pricing, software, incentives, what works and what doesn't. And the goal there is to build a prototype. How does a community incorporate large numbers of electric vehicles? What works and what doesn't? Almost like a hand how-to book. What are the government issues? How do you issue permits, et cetera, et cetera? And then we hope to have that book available that we could, for anybody to use. But, it's, but the, the number of companies, software and product companies interested uh, is, is, very, is, is very, very exciting. Uh, and then an, another very positive thing in the community, the U.S. Navy is a real leader in sustainability. Mm. And, and when you talk to Admiral French at Navy Region Southwest, you know, he does it for budget reasons, but he also does it because the Navy knows, the military knows that every gallon of fuel they deliver to some backwater in Afghanistan <laughs> costs seven to $800 a gallon. If they're able to encourage efficiencies to be able to produce that cheaper, then that not only saves lives, but it, but it saves monies. So, uh, Bruce, you mentioned Veridity is in Philadelphia. Well, Veridity is also in San Diego. They're a Cleantech San Diego member and are working very closely with the Navy uh, as an example. So we have a lot, and I mentioned earlier the, the, the microgrid at UCSD. Yeah. And uh, believe me, there are dozens of companies moving products in and out of there and, and, and real-time testing that they could never do on their own which is also spurning, uh, spurring a lot of innovation. So those are some of the positive things. And again, it's been said here repeatedly about the issue. The issue is regulatory certainty. I mean, see, I, I believe that the private sector will, the demand is so great and the need is so great that the private sector will respond. The role of government is to set the baseline and then just get out of the way. It's a shame that Frank has to correct who has the highest renewable portfolio standards in America. We shouldn't have that conversation. We should have a standard, and the country's so big, the energy is so great, that again, I, I just believe we can, we can reach it, and it's, if we could overcome what I think the lack of, of confidence, confidence that seems to be politically professed in Washington, and the lack of vision that seems to be politically professed in Washington, that, uh, that we can compete uh, successfully with anybody. That, that's excellent conversation. Um, Frank, you know, uh, I think NYSERDA uh, raises the question of how sufficient state policy can be. You know, I think it is a, a moment where it would be nice if, you know, state policy were sufficient. So I'm interested in, you know, to what extent does state policy uh, suffice? And you're doing a wide range of things at some scale, uh, certainly having some de demonstrable impact. Uh, you know, to what extent can we get along with you know, strong uh, uh, activity in our laboratories of democracy? Well, I think state policies, as evidence what's, by not only what's happening in New York, but in California, Ohio, and Tennessee, has a lot to do with success investment, but by itself, it's not going to get us where we want. I mean, we listened to the panel earlier today. The states don't control import-export policy. Uh, <laughs> states don't set national standards. Uh, though I would make the caution that some national standards would just soon not see. I don't want to see the federal <laughs> government come in and impose, for example, a renewable portfolio standard in California or New York that essentially undermines and undoes what we already have in place, what the federal government should be doing is looking to places like Ohio, California, Tennessee, and New York that are leaders and adopting some of those policies rather than settling for what often is the case, which is the lowest common denominator. We need to push, we need to push the envelope, so to speak. But I think states do have an awful lot to, uh, to contribute in terms of promoting and, and realizing the benefits of the clean tech economy. Um, there are problems out there, and some of which we cannot solve by ourselves, and there the federal government could be helpful. We heard it, um, Brian, I think, was particularly effective in the first panel, talking about the, the challenge of finding capital for some of these um, startup companies. The, the reality, that's hard for the states to do, particularly in this fiscal environment. I mean, we're able to do it a little bit at NYSERDA. Our colleagues in economic development, quite frankly, in New York, don't have those resources. We do have a state pension fund. I think you're doing it in California as well, where the comp controller has set aside some funds to help promote uh, the development and location of these green tech companies in New York State. But we clearly could use policies in the federal government that support investment in these sort of uh, clean tech economies. The second thing I think we could use from the federal government, 
is more support for innovation. Again, we heard that in the first panel. And I think what Arun is doing is wonderful. But Arun needs 10 to 20 times more money than is being budgeted. And we sit here, and I mean, we don't sit here. Fortunately, I'm no longer in Washington. But in the outskirts, I mean, out in the hinterland, we listen to what's going on here in Washington, and we just kind of shake our heads. <laughs> Unless we invest in innovation, there is no future. You heard that in the first panel today. And why the federal government should be debating whether or not we should be investing in innovation just totally astounds me. And I guess the final point I would make, and I think part of the reason that some of the states we're talking about here have been successful, is there has been the consistency that we talked about about governmental policy supporting investment in these sort of industries. And I can speak for New York, and I suspect it's true. I know it's true in California. I suspect it may be true in Ohio and Tennessee. That support is not partisan. It's been there in New York through Republican and Democratic administrations. You don't see in the successful states the same sort of partisan bickering right. that you see going on here in Washington. That regardless of how one feels about the particular issues, some may be right, some may be wrong, we need to find a way to come together, I think, as the states have already successfully, at least the successful states have demonstrated, creating jobs is not a Republican or a Democratic issue. It's an issue that we should all come together and adopt policies that make that happen. Thank you, Frank. Uh, so, uh, you know, this has been fascinating, but I do want to open this out now to you in the audience uh, and online. And if you'd like to ask a question at the regional dimension of the clean economy, that, let me ask you just state your name and affiliation or region, because uh, that matters, before asking your question. Uh, so I believe there are some mics ready. And alternatively, if you're watching this on, on the webcast, uh, again, feel free, to, feel free to tweet your question to clean econ or hashtag tag or to email to metroq at brookings.edu. So let's take a few. OK, we'll go, go, go outside first. Sure. We have a, another question from Twitter. We've actually had a number of great questions from Twitter. Here's one from Joe Arellano from the Center for the Next Generation. With increasing budget cuts to states and metro areas, will regions still be able to continue leading the way in clean economy and innovation? Maybe let's go to Jim. Yes. <laughs> I agree. I agree. <laughs> and, 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 uh, and, and I feel strongly about that. And, and the reason is, I'll just, I, it's obvious from the panel, reflects what we're seeing in San Diego. There's so much energy and enthusiasm about this. And remember, it's, there, there's so much diversity. The technologies we're talking about are literally dozens of technologies. Uh, and, and that energy isn't going to go away. Uh, it, it maybe will get tougher with bad policies. It maybe will get longer with, with short money. But uh, the energy and the push to innovate, which has driven certainly our region and other parts of this country for decades, that's, that's as alive and well and, and vibrant as ever. And so, no, I'm optimistic that will continue. Great. I would say, too, you know, the commitment from the business community um, in, in San Diego, it's evident. And then, um, you know, in Northeast Ohio, I mean, they're funding these organizations that are, you know, helping to drive things, the foundation community. So there's other, so you have to be a little more creative sometimes when right. the state and federal um, budgets are not, you know, as optimal. But I think, you know, that's a lot of what we've heard today is the clean economy is about being creative. I mean, it's, it's a whole new world for financing tools, you know, over the course of time. Um, it's a whole new world for, I think, the intersection of economic development and, and the clean energy, you know, economy, which before was all regulatory, you know, mostly regulatory and policy based, and sort of the collision of those things and, you know, understanding utility markets, understanding your PUC. I mean, those things are not you know, IT, um, you know, driven, sort of those same things don't, don't uh, in, in lots of markets, so. I think right. the, the my momentum of uh, the technologies themselves and the private sector and, and native demand yeah. remains, uh, regardless, outside of policy. Jim, I mean, one, okay. one of the lessons we learned in New York, by the way, this, it, the, Jim's right, the short answer is yes, but one of the lessons we learned in New York is because of the difficult fiscal situations a lot of states are in, you need to find a way of being creative and isolating the revenues that support these activities right. from the general treasury. And one of the reasons why we've been able to sustain our investment in the type of technologies I've talked about is because my colleagues over at the State Public Service Commission were willing to take the heat 
and impose a small surcharge on electric and gas bills and then dedicate that money to my authority Thank along you. with the proceeds we get from the Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative, which is a, a carbon uh, emission-based program here in the Northeast. And those revenues have given us predictability. And then we get back to what you heard in the first panel, that private sector needs predictability and certainty in order to be willing to make investments. That's great. I think the other thing to remember is there is a huge predictable driver behind all of this, which is global energy demand. You know, over the next right. 30 years or so, we're going to see an increase in global energy demand of something like 50, 60 percent. We're going to have to find 15 terawatts. And yeah, commodities are volatile. Government policies are volatile. Sure. But rising That's populations right. and standards of living are inexorable. Yeah. Hmm. So it's an inherent pull globally. Let's take a few in, in, in the room. Let's see. How about back here? Thank you. Robert Holm from Jobs for the Future. Uh, in Ohio and I heard New York both mention the workforce being a part of your regional strategies or the community college as you even said in New York being yes. maybe the most important. Um, the, the whole, most of the dialogue today has especially been focused on the research and sort of engineering and scientist level, but uh, what, to what extent has the creation of opportunities for under baccalaureate degree workforce um, been a part of your strategies and what's the challenges in having that be an integrated mm -hmm. piece of your strategies? If I could respond to that first, uh, a, a, here's a perfect example. We received a grant with some other uh, NGOs in San Diego called EDGE, it's an education grant. And what was the education grant about? We very active algae to biofuel industry. The question is what are the jobs of the future? Right. So by working with the universities and with our community college districts and with private industry, we actually created a curricula to train the both high school and community college persons for these bioenergy jobs. And that curricula has actually the first class just graduated. So it was, a, again, a state incentivized program that we ran recognizing that what are the jobs of the future and how do you train people for them? It was a very good program. We're, I mean, we're settling on basically the same model for how we, um, you know, make sure that the, because I think you run into particular challenges with emerging industries is, um, you know, what are the jobs going to be? Getting some of the, the earlier stage and medium-sized companies to think about what the jobs are going to be, you know, three years from now or, you know, seven years from now, depending on the, the training cycles. And, and the workforce system is that, as it's set up is not necessarily set to do those jobs of the future, you know, sort of link. And the community colleges are that natural alignment when you're thinking about proactive strategies like that. So, so we've solved it in, in much the same, I mean, slight differences, but much the same way. Yeah, we, yeah, that's good, that's same. A, a very good question. Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, President Obama has come to Albany twice in the last 18 months. Mm -hmm. And interesting enough, the first time he came, he went to the local community college. Just to make the point that you're talking about, that we need to invest in creating and affect the workforce of the future, we fund, uh, through NYSERDA, to 40 training sites all across the state, primarily through the community college networks. Again, in the Albany area, one of the hallmarks of, I think, of our success is the local community college there has actually built a campus that does nothing but educate young people on how to deal with fuel cells, energy efficiency, PVs, and you'll see these stories, I think, repeated elsewhere around the country. Uh, but it's an essential part of making this whole thing work. One wrinkle of, of the new Brookings Patel research, uh, you know, touches on this. I mean, first, it, it notices the the very balanced occupational profile of the clean economy as defined uh, in our work, and notices that there are many opportunities uh, for less educated uh, workers. At the same time, uh, you know, Jonathan and I make the, the strong point that, you know, we need to have market, uh, a market understanding of the clusters and real industries in places to tune our training. And I think it's been difficult right. to uh, shape our uh, workforce systems uh, work when we don't really know in, in most places uh, a lot about the profile of the right. clean economy. Let's take uh, one more uh, in here. Any, any other? How about, uh, uh, let's see, back here. Yep. 
Thank you. I'm Rick Ryback with Just Economics. And I have a two-part question. I was sort of wondering, um, uh, would a 10 to 20 percent sales tax on construction labor and materials have an adverse impact on the creation of new factories, new manufacturing facilities, as well as on weatherization and solarization activities? And assuming that the answer to part one is yes, sh should we focus on the state and local property tax, which while it's only one or two percent of value, unlike a sales tax, which is paid once, we pay the property tax on buildings each and every year that an improvement adds value to the property. So using a net present value calculation, this typical state and local property tax has the economic impact of a 10 to 20 percent sales tax. And I'm wondering if this isn't having an adverse impact on efforts to make weatherization, new factories and plants and equipment affordable, both on the demand and the supply side. Hmm. I think the challenge with, with weatherization is, is that uh, you know, there are lots of very good technologies that are available now or very near to being available that, that have a pretty short payback time. So they actually make a lot of economic sense to implement. And, and so the, the problem is, is, is one of the, the financing model. And, and uh, you know, there's maybe a little bit of a problem in the competition between, you know, a new kitchen countertop and, and, and a new, uh, you know, high efficiency furnace. There's aesthetic things that come into play as well. But the principal problem is, is that, it, you know, if you don't have that upfront capital, the fact that you you, uh, you know, life cycle, make money on the deal is, yeah. is actually meaningless. So I think if you look <laughs> around the country, there are some places that have been experimenting at ways to, uh, you know, uh, recover uh, over time through uh, utility bills and okay. things like that, the capital investments that are needed to make those improvements. And if you could do that in a systematic way, I think it could have a, a, a huge effect on the market for those kind of weatherization and energy efficiency products for, uh, for, for, for homes. I think for, for businesses, it's a little bit easier because people can do a cold-hearted yeah. return on investment calculation. But for homeowners who may be struggling to pay bills, you, you do need some other sort of mechanism. And the ability to scale up yeah. large numbers of these transactions. Let's, uh, I think, you know, we do need to move to our final dialogue now. So first, uh, uh, I want to uh, uh, urge everyone to stay seated uh, as we bring Governor Ritter up and uh, uh, prepare for that dialogue. But first, uh, just join me in thanking, uh, I think, these very smart and assertive uh, leaders. So thank you all. That's OK, Bruce. Excellent statements. I think California has done a lot of really good How would you <laughs> Else that was great. Thank you, Mark. Actually, I'm going to put the table in between the two of them. Double stores in right now. And, um, and, and I, I appreciate um, folks sticking around. Um, there's nothing like air conditioning at Brookings, right, in a typical summer day. 
Uh, that was not meant as a high carbon comment, but you know. <laughs> um, and, and also to the folks who are hanging in there on the webcast and the Twitter sphere, um, et cetera, et cetera, um, thank you. Uh, this is a real treat. Um, uh, Governor Ritter uh, clearly gained uh, a well deserved reputation uh, as someone who is at the cutting edge of energy, environmental, economic development policy during his tenure. And I think our report probably you know, shows you some of the fruits of the labor uh, in terms of Colorado and Denver metropolis uh, with you know, very clear traction you know, as we transition. Um, the other reason, obviously, that we invited him here today, uh, he's now at Colorado State um, running a sort of new center around the energy economy. And so um, successful former governor, now basically in this space of economy and energy and environment, perfect sort of combination. I thought what I would do um, is start with the retrospective and then do the current and the perspective, but allow you to describe what you got done in Colorado, both from a substantive perspective, so we can situate you know, what's the role and uh, responsibility of the states, but then this political question. Because you're in a town where no one thinks anything will ever get done again <laughs> um, of an affirmative nature, right? So how did you get it done? Well, I'm going to start by saying this morning's panels were excellent. I'm a little confused coming out of it because I've long said that Colorado has the second most aggressive renewable energy <laughs> standard. I'm just now not sure who we're second to. Is it California or is yeah, it yeah, yeah. New York? But we're You're dropping fast. But by God, we're second. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, so we, we took this uh, we took this from campaign through four years of governing. Um, this was the center point of my administration was developing what we tagged at the time in, in the campaign in 2006 as a new energy economy. It was based upon this premise that you could diversify your energy portfolio. If you focused on clean energy, you could address environmental issues, you could create economic development as a part of that, and you could do it protecting ratepayers along the way, that you could provide some equity. And we wound up calling these the four E's, energy, environment, economic development, and equity. Um, we know that education is a part of it, so you can add a fifth E. Um, and then over time, we just believe that policy support was one part of it. Mm -hmm. Not the only thing, but it was critical for us at the state level to provide as much policy support for the new energy economy as we could. So I signed 57 separate bills over a four-year period that in some way had uh, an impact on developing this new energy economy. I mentioned our renewable energy standard. It's, it's a really good story to tell. The voters of Colorado actually passed a renewable energy standard. They were the first voters in the country to do it at the ballot box in 2004, so it was before I was governor, but we knew there was an appetite for a renewable energy standard. We doubled that for the investor-owned utility when, we, uh, when I became governor I, right away in the first 100 days. Uh, we did it within a 2% rate cap uh, by the time I had served uh, three years, we were going into the fourth year, uh, we looked at this and said we can go to a 30% renewable energy standard by 2020 and not change the rate cap. Uh, that was because our major investor-owned utility, XL Energy, really had a path forward to get to the 20% by as early as 2015, and they were well within the rate cap. And this is a really important part of the equity conversation to think about how you protect rate payers in getting there. Um, so, so that was one part of the story, the renewable energy standard. And the fact that in 2004, a lot of people um, who were opposed to a renewable energy standard wound up supporting us when we had it before the legislature and were increasing it because they had seen that there was, A, the ability to do it, and second, that there was economic development attached to it. We, um, we did a variety of things around transmission, around net metering. Energy efficiency is something that's been mentioned. We looked at the financing part of this. We, in Colorado, we have a great quarter, I say the world's best quarter, for renewable energy research. Uh, the National Renewable Energy Laboratory, along with a co-laboratory that we developed of uh, the three major research universities. We've seen that um, attract private R&D. ConocoPhillips has decided to build its global facility 
for renewable and alternative research in Colorado. Siemens has a wind test site. There's a campus of solar companies that have built a research technology campus. And, and you know, there's just a variety of different ways of looking at the public and private where innovation matters, where R&D matters, but developing at the core of the ecosystem an, a research and development center was really important to it, and we tried to do everything we could to help that and to inspire that. We've got you know, a, a commercialization of technology transfer at our universities, a super cluster at CSU is a great example of where we use the cluster idea for, uh, it's a smaller community, it's Fort Collins, but it's an enormous, um, advantage to this university, which is thinking about all the ways that we can transfer technology out of it. Now, what we saw as a result of that, and I, we developed a climate action plan that was actually tied to our, our uh, energy plan because we believed as we diversified the portfolio and decreased the amount of, of, of carbon-based resources that we could look at emissions and, and actually set goals that were achievable goals. And then uh, we said, you know, there'd be economic development. And this is crucial for, I think, the report that you mm -hmm. published today from Brookings to show the number of jobs, job creation, job growth. We experienced that in Colorado in a pretty significant way. If you look at the private sector through the recession, right, the worst recession since the Great Depression, the one place where we grew jobs was in clean tech and clean energy. There are some great stories to tell. Vestas, the world's largest turbine manufacturer, uh, they um, are a Danish company, but they were looking somewhere in North America to site their manufacturing, and it was their first plant. They decided on Colorado, and they decided on Colorado not because of economic incentives that we put on the table, but because we had a policy embrace for clean energy. They cited their first there. They've now built an additional three plants. Three of the four are operational. The fourth is about to open. 2,500 jobs will ultimately be what comes because of one company, but then their suppliers, so there's a multiplier effect to having um, a wind manufacturer there because their suppliers have moved to Colorado, and then indirect jobs that are created because of the direct jobs, and, and that's just one company. And we, get, we have great examples. SMA Solar, they manufacture inverters in Germany, and they decided to manufacture outside of Germany for the first time, and they chose Denver, Colorado as the place to manufacture. Again, not that we're, in particularly in a downturn, able to lure companies there by putting a lot of cash on the barrel head. What we did was say we're really serious about policy support for clean energy industry. So let me ask you this question because I, I find it interesting talking about Siemens, talking about Vestas. I mean, you're really talking about some of the best in class international firms, right? Um, so this morning the conversation was about exports and how the U.S. thinks about the clean economy as part of an export-oriented strategy. What you're describing is the ability to, to attract in foreign direct investment, whether it's equity, equity, whether it's firms. And in our system, that really is the state role and the local and metro role. So how did you go about that? I mean, was that, were you building on uh, sort of a, a, a past history uh, in the governor's office or throughout state government, or is this something where you really, uh, because of the disruptive nature of this sector, really have to develop new ties, new relationships to these foreign investors? We had a sector in place for sure already, and I think uh, what we did was try and emphasize that. When you're a governor of a state, you want to brand that state as a place, you know, companies want to be, that people want to work, that you have, you know, workforce to support that, that you have an educated population, so you have an educated workforce. And, and so you basically try and, you know, develop that brand and mark that brand. And what we think we did was um, say, listen, this isn't just a brand. This is a brand that's going to be backed by uh, policies, and that those policies will provide to the extent you can as a state, both market certainty and regulatory certainty. There's been a lot of conversation up here this morning about certainty, appropriately so, right. because it's the most significant thing that investors have to consider. There's been a lot of conversation about the role of the federal government in providing that certainty, and, and quite frankly, they're right. The federal government could do um, so much more in allowing for market certainty in the clean tech and clean energy place until they do. Um, states can do their part in providing certainty. And if you look at the places that have, you know, the high renewable energy standards, you can definitely see that there has been um, investment, there have been investment decisions made 
because of the kinds of policy embrace that you have at the state level. So I want to, so let's um, move from the retrospective to the current and the prospective. Built this incredible platform, attracted investment, uh, it's the gift that keeps on giving because you've got the clusters and the corridors across uh, private, nonprofit, et cetera. Um, Jim Rossman said today he was neurotic in the short term <laughs> and bullish for the long term. Uh, great phrase. Um, we should tweet that. <laughs> um, are you neurotic in the short term? <laughs> and this is not a personal clown. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, I. <laughs> <laughs> You're from Colorado, so it's sort of. <laughs> so, you know, yes, uh, I think I just met with a group of folks from the private sector. We were meeting with the head of the Kansas City Federal Reserve. Mm -hmm. um, uh, Tom Honig's this fantastic guy. He's been in, uh, at the Federal Reserve for 38 years, and he asked for a group of folks from the private sector and myself to come together and discuss this. And, and there was some great pessimism on the part of people who were in the private sector. There was a reference earlier today to this foreign affairs article by David Victor and Kasia Janasek. They co-authored it. And, you know, I mean, it's pretty pessimistic, right? right. They call it the crisis in clean energy uh, finance or clean energy economy. And so there's a lot of, there are a lot of signals that are sort of providing for uncertainty to those people making investment decisions. Clearly, we, are, we have so much potential. And I think the, 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 the report, the Brookings report, outlines the kind of potential and the kinds of things that can be there in regions to support this sort of ecosystem of clean energy and clean technology. But I think we're at this place where we have to make some very serious decisions as a country. And those decisions are about certainty. And uh, Brian's description about what happens sort of uh, to those companies that get you know, upfront money because they're innovative, they've got a great idea, they've been sort of brought into the marketplace, out of the laboratory, and now they need stable investment. And stable investors, they actually, you know, back away from really innovative things that haven't been proved over time. And what they do is they return to those kinds of things that they consider, the, the, the stable investors return to investments that they know have a history that they believe is going to be there in the long time, but they actually don't in, uh, drive the thing we need to do most in America, which is innovate. And, and we see this in Colorado as this place where we have so much happening in the laboratories that I've described, private, public, institutional, you know, higher ed laboratories. There's so many important things happening, but it's a really hard thing to sort of untie the Gordian knot of investment or financing for those companies that, that are um, needing to get to that next place. And, and I think that's a place where there's some reason for concern and without some type of certainty. And, and again, both regulatory and market certainty, either on the finance side or the policy side, and really ideally a combination of both, um, we could be in trouble. So let me follow on with, by asking the China question, you know, because it was raised in one of the prior sessions. Um, what is our comparative advantage? I suppose you can answer this um, with the perspective that maybe we do get our act together and provide certainty. I mean, I'm, you know, this is not something that's going to happen anytime soon, let's say, next six months, next year. But you can answer it with regard to that. Or, even more dire, we drift at the national scale, and we have states that begin to do innovative things. But how, wh how do we think about the build-out of this sector, given... Um, <laughs> China's commitment to be at the vanguard. Yeah, uh, so let's take the kind of downside of this right. comparative, or maybe what I would say the comparative disadvantage. China you know, has made a real commitment to the renewable space, $780 billion commitment over a 10-year period. Um, five years ago, China had zero companies in the top five solar manufacturing in the world. Now they have four out of the top six. So you can see the sort of outcome of making a, a, a determined move along the area of renewable energy and renewable energy investment. Uh, having said that, you know, companies decide on manufacturing for a variety of things. People think we lose out to China because we have, they have such lower labor costs. And quite frankly, if you take just solar as an example, uh, robotics plays such an important role in that that labor is not the most significant cost. Uh, the most significant, you know, uh, decision making, the, the, the two most, the two things that people 
or companies are deciding uh, about China in terms of manufacturing have to do with actually the cost of energy because it's pretty energy intense to be manufacturing, not so labor intense, and the second is market certainty. And so they provided with sort of their direction this market certainty. And, and you know, that's, um, if you think about, um, uh, about regional efforts, like Reggie is, is a great example. Reggie provides some, you know, limited though, but, but still some market certainty. And so, um, you know, there's a reason New Jersey has the second most installed solar in the country. I often ask people, you know, okay, California's first, who's second? And um, it's New Jersey, and there's a reason it's New Jersey, because New Jersey was dealing with Reggie, I think, as a part of it. And there's then a region that, uh, a reason that you can see a variety of uh, activities happening with respect to the solar industry. But if you think about wind, energy efficiency, solar, geothermal, I mean, across, those, across the spectrum, we have a lot of different advantages over China. Vestas made a decision about manufacturing in America after they decided it was too expensive to transport turbines mm -hmm. to America. So luckily, mm -hmm. Colorado sort of won the Vestas competition once they got to America. But they, you know, they had a, certainly to go through China and, and analyze that first. It costs less to transport um, to transport um, solar materials and to transport panels and things like that. But I think, you know, in the last panel when they talked on, about San Diego and putting solar manufacturing there, we see that. We see it in Arizona. Uh, SunTech made a decision to manufacture in Arizona. We were in that competition. We lost out to Arizona. Why did we lose out? Because they wanted to be where the market is going to be most significant. And Arizona and Southern California has the most significant market for manufacturing panels because they're going to have the greatest installation. So in, so in some respects, what you're, and this is, I think, fundamentally a role for governors and for other executives in the political system and some of the major CEOs, there's an education role with regard to both U.S. advantages and assets and with regard to the competition we, we face because the China competition is different from, I think, what the conventional wisdom would hold it to be. Our, the, the role of manufacturing right. in the economy in general but also in the clean economy in specific is much more dramatic than I think people understand. You know, we always say at Brookings, you know, if you had a poll of the American citizenry of what we import, everyone would be able to say, you know, almost to the article of clothing, that's what we import. If you ask people, what do we manufacture and export, they would go, uh, you know, maybe we talk about Boeing, but I'm not sure we would get far beyond that. So there's this huge education role that it seems like we have to have in our system to sort of at least get us all on the same playing field as to what our potential is and what kind of competition we face. So just, uh, and, and especially in this context, it's so this is gonna underscore your point. Um, the last time we had a recession um, since the millennium, housing sort of brought us out of the recession. There's a big bubble built around housing, then it burst and we have the Great Recession. And most of the economic economists that I trust will say the thing that will bring us out of this recession will when we begin to manufacture and export again. And and so you know I was in this debate that was about can this lead the um, the American economy out of the downturn? I don't, I don't know if it can lead it. It has to be a part of it because right. it's a place where there will be a global demand where we actually have you know the the right level of R and D and innovation or or the ability to expand upon that. But if we become the manufacturers of the technology, then we can find this as one place where we'll lead the world and we'll be able to grow our economy in a significant way in the sector that we need to to come out of the downturn, right, in manufacturing. So this idea about manufacturing and export is, I think, critical to it. And, and also, if we don't put the right policy supports in place, we will cede that to other places in the world, including China. So let me ask one other narrative question that you may have come across in Colorado, but is clearly one of the cartoon kind of comments that we have in the national debate. If we're going to build out a clean economy, we must be talking about industrial policy, right? We're going to be picking winners and losers and so forth. What's never really mentioned in the debate is that we've just had the biggest industrial policy for the last 30 years, was called the real estate sector, right? yeah. <laughs> supported by any number of uh, federal direct and indirect supports. But how did you deal with that kind of sort of uh, easy critique of the, of the public sector trying to bring certainty to markets 
and trying to have the right incentive structure, ecosystem, for the build out of this. Actually, uh, I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't say it was easy right. to deal with, but here's how we dealt with it. And, and in context, you know, Colorado is also a very big extractive state. Um, we produce oil, gas, coal, gas meaning natural gas. There's a lot of concerns about this winners and losers. And we tried to say this isn't a zero sum game. You don't do you know, these things so that there's you know, less of this. And particularly, it's interesting where natural gas was concerned. And uh, the gentleman from GE earlier talked about you know, their own work on natural gas as an integrator with renewable energy. And you really can see the benefits from an emissions perspective if you are able to utilize both. Now, I think there's a lot that the industry must do to ensure that they extract in an environmentally sound way. There's debates going on throughout the country. We revised our rules. We modernized our rules in Colorado for natural gas extraction. But we said there's not winners and losers. This is about emissions. And, you know, and, and so we're not trying to pick winners. We're just trying to to produce energy in a way that's diverse, that's domestic, that's clean, and that at the end of the day we can demonstrate will create jobs. And, and those were the core operating principles. And uh, quite frankly, at the end of the day, we, we, uh, we did a variety of things you know, on the clean energy side, the energy efficiency side, but we also did a fuel switch where we said for a gigawatt of power, we're going to transition it from coal to natural gas because we had you know, reformed the rules. We believed we were extracting gas in a pretty environmentally sound way. And that now natural gas can play this really important part in reducing emissions. It's a job creator. And so for us, it was really about dealing with this over you know, several years as, um, as not you know, winners and losers, as not something that where we're trying to pick what's going to be here for the next 20 years, but saying, we've got something that we have to handle, which I believe you know, we have these serious environmental issues. One of the real tragedies has been the politicization of climate change uh, and, and, and you know, how it can actually stymie the development of clean energy policy because people think, well, if you're for clean energy, that means you believe climate change is happening and my goodness, that could you know, give us a whole set of mandates and regulatory policy we don't want. We, we should really look at this as this economic development tool that can allow us at the same time to create jobs and address environmental concerns, serious environmental concerns, even apart from climate change. That's very helpful. Um, I feel the Twitter sphere twitching. <laughs> um, but, you know, so, but I, just for the folks in the room and for the Twitter sphere and for anyone who wants to email, um, just, just one other question because I want you to talk a little about what you're doing now at Colorado State and how you relate that work to the policy challenge we have. I mean, again, everyone's talked about it. We're in this moment of uncertainty. We're not sending any kind of coherent signals to anyone out of Washington, right? So does your work directly relate to the kind of policy choices that need to be made, first at the national level, and if it doesn't happen at the national level, at the state and metro scale? So Bruce, uh, what I decided to do after leaving the governor's office was to go to Colorado State University. Um, it's this fantastic school focused in a variety of ways on sustainability, um, on, on, on issues that have to do with energy, but their relationship to food production, their relationship to water and water issues, water consumption, water quality, and, and you know, the campus is thematic in how they deal with sustainability. And there's also great research happening in all this, this variety of, on, on the energy and engine side. So I, I decided to go there and, and, and start this policy institute that would basically work with state governments, with uh, local governments, and with uh, business alliances, sort of on the theory that until the federal government actually acts in a way that provides us with comprehensive energy policy, um, that, that we need to do all we can utilizing state governments and local governments to promote clean energy. Now, there's a variety of ways of doing that. And, you know, there's, there's politics in state government and at the local level. But the point that, um, that I believe you may have made earlier today, or perhaps was made in that, in that first by Brian, that first uh, panel, the, the further away from the federal government you get, sort of regional, metro, local, the less there are politics. And so what we're trying to do is sort of inspire this dialogue on clean energy agendas 
from what I would call the bottom up, but certainly working in state governments. I don't think we did it all in Colorado. I don't think we're, uh, you know, that, that there, there are so many good examples of places that have done some things differently and, and done, quite frankly, some things better. But we're trying to take all of those, um, sort of that menu of options and provide them to state governments and say, you want comprehensive clean energy policy, we can help you get there. It'll take a little while and it won't be done in a day, but we can help you get there. Very helpful. Twitter? Yeah. Um, not the sort of favor this, but. <laughs> no, I really do have a question. It's actually not from Twitter. It's one of our emailed in questions. And it's from Saul Shapiro, who's actually from Aurora, Colorado. He asks, so much of the clean economy is subsidy driven and continual buildup is used to justify continued subsidies and focus on the short term. How do we transition to a long term strategy? So um, I think most of our energy policy is subsidy driven and has been for a very, very long time in this country. And so we can't just sort of pick on the clean economy and say it's subsidy driven. How do we get away from that? Quite frankly, there is a path forward, I think, on the clean side without subsidies as you just watch what's happened uh, for the price of, of various, what I would call, renewable commodities, solar and wind. Um, while I was governor, I think the price of solar reduced some 40 to 50 percent installed solar. Now that's, in a four-year period, pretty dramatic. That price curve seems to continue to come down. And, and in part, that's the role of subsidies is to do what they can to inspire a new technology. And then hopefully over time, it comes down. Uh, on the wind side, there was mention earlier of the production tax credit. And you know I think it's 2.1 or 2.2 cents a kilowatt hour. Um, but, but you know we just saw a company, actually our utility, XL Energy, just offered Boulder, Colorado, 200 megawatts of wind at 3.2 cents a kilowatt hour in what's called 50% operating capacity, meaning that will be at capacity 50% of the time. That's an incredible deal for wind. And it means, if you do the math on that, that wind is at parity, right, for, for that, that place that they're offering that. It's at parity with natural gas, at parity and maybe even cheaper than coal. Now, it's still intermittent, but if you think back to the GE discussion this morning, you combine wind and, and natural gas, you still get this tremendous reduction in emissions, and you do it at a price that is very, very competitive, and you can do it, I think, over time without a subsidy. The wind producers still want the subsidy, right? They want the subsidy, but the problem with that subsidy, the problem with the production tax credit is that it doesn't provide certainty. It comes and goes. The last time we put it you know, back in play was at the bailout that happened before the election under President Bush, right before the election of 2008. It's going to expire in 2012. And so wind producers actually back off of that, not because they necessarily think they can't survive without it. They just don't want to plan something and then have that subsidy come back, and they don't get to take advantage of it. Right. Looks like a poor investment decision. And so what we need to do is figure out, are we going to do it long term or are we going to do it without it? Because either way, you would get investment decisions that are not based upon sort of the whimsical nature of a tax credit that comes and goes every couple of years. The investment tax credit has been very helpful to solar. The cash grants that were provided sort of at the end as part of the Recovery Act that you could do in lieu of the production tax credit, that's been helpful. But quite frankly, the single biggest thing that we could do as a country that would provide regulatory and market certainty at the same time would be to put a price on carbon. And, and, and apart from doing that, I think, you know, we'll use tax laws to kind of right. watch things come and go. But as you do that, you'll see investment decisions come and go as well. Absolutely. I couldn't agree more. Um, questions, comments, criticisms? It's Brookings. Everyone, you know. I'm a former governor. Free, free criticisms. <laughs> Hi, my name is Sarah Smith. I'm a reporter with Platts. Um, I have a very report-specific question. It's about the inclusion of public mass transit as part of the clean energy economy. I feel that there would be probably some people that would find that as sort of a broad categorization of clean energy, and I was wondering if you could elaborate on the decision to include that and kind of the thought process behind it. Yeah, I think I'm gonna turn to Mark, or, or Mark wants to, you know, because there was a lot of back and forth over this, and so let's let the researchers yeah, respond. That, that decision, I think, is ex exactly the kind of work we need to do to, to try to make visible uh, what this economy is. And that is very much based on, you know, 
overall carbon impacts of an activity. And we try to take a broad uh, look here, and we're trying to also anticipate uh, uh, both or we're trying to build on prerequisites, uh, uh, precedents in European analysis, but also that are informing the Bureau of Labor Statistics' his own uh, thinking. So we're trying to, th this is an emerging, you know, I think consensus decision that on balance in our transportation system, transit is uh, a carbon uh, uh, efficient uh, uh, activity. So that's, that's, that's the thinking there. And how big is that? sector. I mean. It's a substantial, you know, piece of the clean economy. And if you disagree, feel free to leave that uh, out. Uh, one of the, I think, virtues of the way we approach this is we, you know, uh, uh, built up a clean economy out of 39 smaller segments. So that allows different, uh, you know, states, different metro areas, different audiences to, to assemble the clean economy that they see. I think most people will look to our you know, set of clean tech uh, uh, subsidies, which is, a, again, a portion of this larger uh, mm -hmm. group of segments. So I think it also reflects what communities across America are looking at. You know, we did a study of, of sort of our transportation system in Colorado. And, uh, not only had we grown significantly as a population over a 20-year period, 25-year period, we'd also began driving more miles per person. So you have this, you know, multiplier effect on, on how you're using the transportation system. And um, what you're seeing is communities deciding how to develop based upon transportation. So you have, you know, transportation-oriented development as a way of thinking about this and a way really of thinking about how you reduce your carbon footprint as a community developer. Other questions? Right, right back there. Yeah. Andre Pettigrew with the uh, Climate Prosperity Project. Governor, former Coloradan, by the way. Andre. Um, there was a question earlier about uh, the fact that states and local governments are going to have less resources in order to push this clean economy. Can't expect much from the federal. What would you say are some of the strongest leverage points, knowing that the dollars won't necessarily be there and that you have to be creative? What, are, what would you say, as a governor, are some of the key leverage points that communities should be looking towards? Well, I, I really do think that there are a variety of policy supports you can put in place that actually don't have um, a fiscal impact on state government. Now, you, you, somewhere, you know, for something like a renewable energy standard, uh, people look at this and say, well, somebody's going to pay it in the day. That's why it was so important to me to emphasize rate caps as a part of that. Uh, we've seen communities and states actually uh, look at feed-in tariffs. And, you know, if you're going to look at a feed-in tariff, I think the European lesson is that you have to look at how you protect rate payers in the course of that or how you protect taxpayers for that. And, and so uh, there's just a, a lot of things you could do. We did net metering. So net metering is something that's been done around the country, but Colorado hadn't gone there. Net metering winds up having a positive impact on rate payers. And, you know, utilities and rural electric associations, they're going to have to figure out sort of how to do that. And it might have some fiscal impact on them, but at the end of the day, um, that can be very helpful for consumers who desire to do things around generating clean energy uh, themselves. And, and so if you, if you go through it, I mean, there's just uh, so many different ways. There was a discussion this morning about how do we finance that, and this question from the back of the room about property taxes versus sales taxes. Well, there, we had this great system, and we're not the only ones, right? It was uh, a lot of places in the country, PACE financing, right, where you could increase your property tax assessment voluntarily, the county or the region looks at that increase in taxes. They bond against that future income. And with the bond money, then they pay for the price of upfront, um, upfront construction of renewable systems for residences or businesses. This was something that was taken off in a pretty significant way in Colorado when uh, uh, Freddie, uh, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac said, well, we don't want to be second to that kind of a, a voluntary uh, increase in your property tax assessment. And they really shut down PACE financing. That's a, a place where the United States Congress could go back and say to them, you know what, we are going to allow that to happen. We're going to allow that to happen because it inspires 
clean energy investment at the residential or the industrial level, and that's a really important policy choice for us. And, and so, again, you can do that without an impact right to state or local government, and it really has a, a measurable impact on the demand level for folks who otherwise not, may not be able to afford a renewable system. Excellent. There was a question right over here, and then... Hi, my name is Dave Karpinski with uh, Nortec, Northeast Ohio region. I'd like you to comment on the, um, there's a lot of discussion about the subsidies for fossil fuels and the subsidies for renewables and kind of what, what's your take on how much of a factor is that really in the, in the takeoff of renewables and how much should we be, I guess, considering that? You know, when you think about the dollar value of the subsidy in the fossil fuel industry, it's a small percentage of the industry where the, the dollar value in the renewables is a higher percentage, but just kind of want your, your take on how we should think about that. Well, first of all, I think, that, again, the dollar values are, are um, coming down. And, and, and really, um, if you look at price curves, it's important to understand the place that a subsidy can play in inspiring innovation. But then, you know, over time, how that role may have to shift to either no subsidies or something that is an, a level playing field. I have people in the renewable and, the, and in the energy efficiency industries all the time say, listen, uh, okay, forget subsidies, but let's just have an even playing field. Remove them all together. And, you know, there was a time when Congress was debating a thing called the independent drilling costs. It's a tax credit that natural gas producers or oil producers, for instance, they receive. And the industry said, you know, basically we're going to have a very difficult time surviving without it. There was great volatility at the time in the natural gas uh, markets. And so I supported keeping the independent drilling costs because our natural gas producers had seen the price of their commodity go from $13 a, a MCF to $2. And, and, you know, I mean, that's huge volatility, right? And so now it's at this stable pricing point. And I think um, what we have to do is, is decide are we going to have some subsidies or not and what role it plays, again, in doing the thing we need to do most, most which is creating jobs and diversifying our energy portfolio. And until you have sort of broad tax reform, that's why I hit on, on, on carbon pricing. Because there is, it's, it's very difficult, right, to go about, set about tax reform. We haven't really done it since the early 1980s in America. We've added a lot of things to it, taken some away. But if you're going to do it in a broad-based way, it would take a couple of years, even a few years, uh, to even get started on it. And, and what you could do to provide certainty that we don't get from, from tax subsidies right now, what you could do is price carbon. And it would be a market and a regulatory certainty added to the mix that is superior to all else. Let me ask you this question, because I think governors clearly have to manage the partisan politics. But you also have to manage in ways that Washington doesn't quite often, the spatial politics. So you've got a major global city in Denver, frankly, a, global, uh, a major global metropolis. You've got smaller metros. You've got uh, a non-metropolitan area, particularly around your extractive industries. How did that play out um, as you began to develop sort of this robust platform? What, was there ge geographical differences that um, made it more difficult to move policies, or was there a sense that everyone had a particular role to play in the economy build-out so that there was more consensus and collaboration? I'd say that it was, again, difficult. I just, I, will, I won't uh, tell you that any of this was easy. There was some geographical dis, uh, difference, uh, certainly at the beginning of my administration, because there was a sense that developing a clean energy economy was going to benefit, you know, those who could mm. manufacture renewables or produce renewables, and that it was going to be hard on the extractive industries, um, oil and gas industries, particularly in those places that were in, in the state where they were heavily invested in the extractive industries were very suspect. And so we had to manage that, and, and I wouldn't say we managed it perfectly um, or managed it well on some occasions, but we got to that place. We got to that place over time of being able to say, this is, you know, you'll hear people say this all the time, it's about all of the above, right? And for us, all of the above included certainly natural gas, it included um, renewables, it included energy efficiency, and we just kept having to say that again and again and again, but, but people didn't believe us. I mean, there's, there's so much in governing that involves dealing with people who believe life is a zero-sum game, that if there are winners, there have to be losers. And you see this, uh, I would say, the more intense the level of lobbying, 
the more intense the uh, sort of the zero sum feeling is. Right. And that's why we were saying, you know, you get down to the, the regional and the metro areas, the, one of the biggest supporters of us and our economic development agenda, including our clean energy agenda, was the Metro Denver Chamber of Commerce. The guy that runs the Economic Development Corporation, Tom Clark, he's a brilliant guy and he got it, right? And so you hear you know, this debate at the federal level about the Chamber of Commerce being for or against this. It, it wasn't played out at the, at the Metro level because our Denver Chamber of Commerce, the Metro Chamber of Commerce, they saw the job creation potential and then they saw the reality of that and so they, you know, they don't politicize this issue, right? It's not about Republicans or Democrats for them. This is for them about job creation. And, and so managing that space was about, you know, developing a, a broad sense that there are not winners and losers. There don't necessarily have to be winners and losers as long as everybody's sort of in the same place on creating a clean energy economy. Yeah, I love the name of that firm in Philadelphia, Real Win-Win. And I thought, you know, maybe we could use it as a political brand. Um, what's the time, Jack? Oh, okay. <laughs> Not great. Um, I could sit here for uh, days, I think. But um, let, let, me, let me sort of end on this note. Um, I was, you know, it gets back to this question about answering some of the research questions, because I was really heartened by the results of this report, uh, because I had no priors, frankly, as to what the clean economy writ large really would look like, right? And But the fact that it turns out to be so export-oriented, manufacturing intensive, and opportunity rich uh, is completely supportive of a different growth model for the country. And I, particularly this manufacturing piece, because I think for too long in the United States, we've associated innovation, and I'm sure you've had this problem in Colorado, with only the high end, right? You've got to have a doctorate in X, Y, or Z, where manufacturing enables people coming out of, still coming out of high schools, skill providers, community colleges, with an access to the good life. This, this is a really powerful, I think, result. I think what you've reminded us today, again, is the genius of our political system. Irrespective of what happens in this town, we still have the potential to build out this economy state by state and metro by metro. Um, it's gonna take a hell of a lot of hard work. Uh, I wanna invite you back here. I would love to get about six governors, three Republicans, three Democrats, uh, and business leaders back here to Brookings, maybe at the turn of next year, to really have this conversation. If Washington won't lead, what can the states do to basically drive this economy forward? Um, you would be a, a phenomenal voice in that because, again, right. there's nothing like uh, success of, as having done it. So thank you for coming to Brookings. Thank you. Um, thank you all. Thank you. Okay.